بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعقبة المتقين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد النبي العالمين الذي اسمه مكتوب في الإنجيل والتوراة أما بعد فقال الله تعالى في كتابه العزيز بعد عود بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل بفضل الله وبرحمته فبذلك فليفرحوا هو خير مما يجمعون وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم خيركم من تعلم القرآن وعلمه أو كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم my dear brothers and sisters like any great story that we have read, watched, have been exposed to, we understand that the, great, the greatness of the story is hidden behind the background or the backstory or the behind the scenes. That each great story, each great script has a behind the scenes, has a backstory that contextualizes what the story is truly speaking of and the message of the story. Like everything that we have in our time today, even sports, they have the behind the scenes of what's happening in the locker room, what's happening before the players come out on the court. Similarly, the most beautiful stories that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed, they also have a backstory. They also have a behind the scenes where it is nearly impossible for a person to understand the depth of the surah or the depth of the story that is being revealed to us without understanding the backstory and without being able to connect to the behind the scenes. And the behind the scenes in our beautiful tradition of tafsir is called Sha'ni Nuzul. The Sabab al Nuzul, or what in English we would call the reason of revelation, where there was something happening during the Prophet's time, during the Prophet's life at that moment that initiated this revelation. And the backdrop and the behind the scenes of the entire Quran is the seerah of our Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is why Abdullah ibn Abbas used to say, that one cannot even attempt to learn and understand the Qur'an without learning and understanding the life of our Habib وسلم, because it's the backdrop. Understanding what was happening in the Prophet's life is what gives context to every surah, is what allows the motive and the objective that is the intended outcome of that surah to come to light. There is a behind the scenes. So all these beautiful surahs in the Qur'an do have a behind the scenes and the behind the scenes is the Prophet's life where the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is an individual like all of us that experiences pain, difficulty, hardships, which is the default state of life. Where Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, Ya ayyuha al-insan, innaka kadihun ila rabbika kadihan famulaqi. O human being, you will go from one difficulty in one ditch to another ditch until finally you'll come and meet me. In simpler words, the comfort that you are seeking in this world will never truly be attained. فَمُلَاقِي Until you come and see me. And Ibn Hajar rahimahullah mentions in a hadith, فَمُلَاقِي actually refers to that even in this world, a person can find comfort when they find Allah. فَمُلَاقِي فَمُلَاقِي doesn't mean necessarily that we make it to Jannah and then we find peace. But even in this world, a person is able to find peace where they find Allah. Hence the Prophet of Allah would say, جُعِلَتْ قُرَّةَ عَيْنِي فِي الصَّلَاةِ that the happiness and the fulfillment of my life is found in prayer because there I found Allah. People feel comfortable with others of righteousness because they find Allah in that gathering. The Prophet of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions in different verses that There's a human being actually believe that after claiming that they believe that they will not be challenged for that statement is that, do they actually believe that they will not be challenged? Where a man came to the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, inni luhibbuk. Like, I love you. And the Prophet of Allah looked back at him and said, فَانْظُرْ مَا ذَا Are you, like, watch what you're saying. And the man says, well, no, I, I mean, I love you. Why should I be wary of me telling you that I love you? And the Prophet of Allah responds the same way three times. And then he says, well, if your statement holds to be true, then know that difficulties will come your way like how water comes down a hill. That there's no stopping it because belief and faith will constantly be tested with difficulties. And we also know that in order for a person to persevere through those difficulties and to survive the, the turmoil of life, one needs support. Mental support, emotional support. Without that, we can't persevere. Our parents, our siblings, our friends, our spouses, our children. But what about a man who saw more difficulty than all of us, whose life began without a father, 
whose mother is taken from him at the age of five, who is challenged to bury six of his seven children, where he says, That I have been made to be tested for the cause of Allah more than anyone else. What about a man like this? In our Habib sallallahu alayhi wasallam, how was it possible that his heart was so broken yet he was a symbol of happiness and fulfillment for people when they would look at him? That he was a source of comfort for anyone that was in discomfort. Whereas the reality of his heart only he knew and Allah knew that it was in pieces. How was it possible that he was given so much strength? Well, of course, he had emotional support. Well, let's go through the list. No father to teach him the ropes of life. No mother to tell him, no, it's, it's going to be okay. No older sibling. No grandfather. So how was it possible that in each difficulty of his, he was able to persevere? And that is where the background of the entire Qur'an comes. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed each and every verse of the Qur'an to give the Prophet strength. To, to teach him resolve, to allow him to persevere, that this entire revelation, O oh my beloved, is to give you a sense of comfort. And therefore, it was not revealed all at once, like how the Torah and Injil was revealed, because there was a true application of it taking place. Hence, when Aisha was, was, was asked, What was the Prophet's life like? And her response was, كانه, كان القرآن. In one narration, she said, كان خلقه القرآن. That his life was the Quran. In another narration, كان هو القرآن. That he was the Quran. There's a difference between saying he was like the Quran or he was the Quran. This one to say that you play like Jordan, and the other is you are, you are Jordan. There's a difference. And she said he was the Quran. So the entire revelation that came down was the source of emotional and mental support. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intervenes to be a source of support for those who are voiceless and helpless. Where there's no one to support them, Allah intervenes. So each and every one of these revelations actually supports that concept. With the Prophet of Allah in the beginning of revelation, after, six, after receiving Iqra, for six months there's no Qur'an. There's no wahi. And finally, after six months, when the Prophet of Allah is taunted and he's, and he's assaulted verbally by the people around him that this thing that you're talking about, it was hallucination. It wasn't real. If it was real, why would Allah stop it? And people started saying that maybe Allah has left you. Na'udhu billah. And Allah revealed, and the Prophet was broken. In a sense of pain, Allah said, look, I got your back. Wadduha. Wallayli idha saja. Your Lord has, will never leave you, has never left you or abandoned you, and He will, all, will never be upset at you. But know for sure that your akhirah is more important than your dunya. And as long as that, and as long as that world view is kept consistent, you will always come through some struggle. But I have never left you. Allah didn't say that you won't struggle. He simply said that in those struggles, you know that, I'm, you know that I'm there. And the fact that you know that I'm there is the comfort, is what enables the individual. Like a child who feels uneasy and he sees his mother. It's not like the difficulty went away, but the fact that the mother is there, her presence and love is enough for the person to stop crying. And that is the reality of us being the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, when the Prophet of Allah lost his son, Asim, and he passed away, and Abu Lahab went in the streets of Mecca, celebrating the loss of Qasim. The famous story where he would say, Inna Muhammadan qad ibatara. Na'udhu billahi min that the Prophet will, be, will not have a legacy. No lineage, no legacy. And the Prophet of Allah is already experiencing such pain of having to bury his son, and then on top of that, having to hear the jeers of the people around him. And in this moment of pain, Allah says, Look, I got your back. Simple surah that we were given, much was lost to attain it. Much was lost. The Prophet had to bury his son for him to receive the reconciliation of, you'll be okay. We've given you abundant good. 
Keep praying, keep struggling, keep, keep sacrificing. Your enemy is the one that will not have a legacy or lineage. You continue. The entire Quran's backdrop is the Prophet's life and struggles. And no different is Surah Yusuf, where the Prophet of Allah experiences the most difficult moment of his life. Who can tell us what is the most difficult day or the most difficult moments in the Prophet's life? Anyone? Taif? Brothers, how about you? Khadija? Anyone else? I mean, it's difficult. It's truly difficult to identify a day that is the most difficult when you have like so many. <laughs> For you and I, we can pick and choose and find one. But imagine a person who buried six, seven, seven children and asking him, what was the most difficult one to do? What was the hardest? Aisha anha actually plucked up the courage to ask. And she says, Ya Rasulullah, ayyu yawman ashaddu alayk. What was the most difficult day of your life? And the Prophet responded that in Mecca it was Ta'if and in Medina it was Uhud where I lost my uncle Hamza which was overwhelming for the Prophet And in Ta'if, it wasn't just Ta'if, it was the build-up to Ta'if. The three years of being boycotted and now finally being released and you think, F I, I can make it. That I was struggling, I couldn't find a job, now I found a job, everything is good. The next thing happens where your support system is completely taken away from you internally and externally and Khadija being the internal support system and Abu Talib being the external support system Kadhan, like one difficulty after the next I, just, I was in Jordan just last week with a relief org for three days and we went to one Palestinian orphanage like Palestinian refugee camp and there was a certain there was a certain area in it that were Palestinian orphans and there was a school that had 300 Palestinian orphan children who had disability so this is where I understood the meaning of Kadihun ila rabbika kadahan. This is where I understood this ayah. Kadihun ila rabbika kadahan. One difficulty, and then the next one comes. You're already displaced, which is, which is, which break, which can break a person. Then on top of that, you don't have your parents. And then on top of that, some of these kids have autism. Some of them can't speak. Some of them are blind. It's like famulaqi, where Hassan Basri rahimullah was asked. When will we experience comfort? And he said, That when we finally enter into Jannah and it said to us, That Allah says, I will never be displeased with you. So this is happening to the Prophet of Allah. And now Ta'if takes place. After losing his family, the only reason why the Prophet started exploring another home was because his system that supported him was gone. Or else till that moment, the Prophet never looked anywhere else. Till Khadija was alive, radiallahu anha. Only after she left, the Prophet realized, oh, sallam, that I need to look somewhere else. And he started exploring. The first place he explored was his neighboring city in Ta'if. And he was humiliated, not physically, emotionally being told, could Allah not find someone better than you? Like, can there be a worse statement or a harsher statement to say to even a child? Forget the Sayyidu Huri the Adam, the greatest of all, all time. And you're telling him that, could Allah not find someone better than you? Allah says, Ahum yaqsimun rahmata rabbik. Do they control who earned Allah's blessings? Sometimes we think, oh, you can't get this or you can't get that. Allah says, well, who even gave you the jurisdiction to say that? Nahnu qasamna baynahum ma'ishatahum. We are the ones that have the keys to blessings. No one has the right to tell a mother or a father or a couple that you will not have children. No one has a right to tell a youngster that you won't get a good job. That is, these are blessings of Allah that can only be given by Allah. And the only person that can say whether or not we will receive it is Allah Himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So after this difficult moment of ta'if bleeding to the point that his shoes are clogged with blood and finding some relief finally, and he turns to Allah and he is broken. Oh Allah, I'm just, I, I complain to you about my weakness, that I'm not better. And he's not displacing his anger upon anyone else. He's not putting the blame on anyone else. He's saying that I could have been better. How can Rahmatul Alameen be any better? And that's what he's doing. And then at this moment where the Prophet was the most broken, Allah said, let me take care of you again. In moments of difficulty where the world turns their 
eyes away from us and they close their doors upon us, in those moments is where Allah's mercy and Nusra intervenes. Like what is happening in Gaza. Allah's presence of Nusra is there for those who seek it to be a primary source of support. Not a secondary source of support. Our mothers and fathers don't like it when we go to them after we go to someone else. They prefer that if we go to them first. Like, well, how dare you go to that person first and ask them, then come to me. Similarly, a beloved accepts or expects that we go to them first. You know, in a Desi household, if you end up eating at the neighbor's house before you go home, shh, you're going to be fasting for the next week. Right? Like, Allah, we primary source. And when Allah becomes the primary source, not the backup plan. No one likes to be the backup plan. How would Allah appreciate being the backup plan of our life? That when I have more time, I'll study ilm. When I have more time, I'll go to the masjid. When I have more money, I'll support people. Allah doesn't need our leftovers. Ahsin, the Prophet says, Ahsin kama ahsan Allahu ilayk. Give Allah the best the way He gave you His best. So in that moment of difficulty where there was no one there, Allah supported the Prophet through three unique blessings. Just quickly, the first one, being the conversion and Islam of all the jinn. The humans don't want to accept you. Let me show you what the jinn will do with you. And they all accept it on the journey back to Mecca. Number two, the world, the people of the world have shut their doors upon you. Don't stress it, Ya Rasulullah. Subhanallah asra bi abdihi layla. Let me take you up and speak to you. Let, let, let me and you talk. What Musa alayhi salam begged for his entire life, Allah gave to the Prophet in one difficulty of this. When Musa alayhi salam said, Wallah, please let me see you. Let me just get a glimpse of you. And Allah exposes his light in the mark, in the raqia. Everything is, falls into dust. And Musa alayhi salam passes out. And Allah is saying to the Prophet of Allah, وَالنَّجْمِ إِذَا هَوَى مَا ظَلَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ وَمَا غَوَى مَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَى إِنْ هَتَأَنَّ بِثُمَّ دَنَا فَتَدَلَّى فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ وَأَدْنَى The Prophet of Allah was called up when people turned him away. When people say that we're not good enough, it's our time to understand that the only, the only responder to that call is Allah. Like how it happens in life when our friends turn up against us and people of the world turn their backs against us. We go to those whom we know will always appreciate us like our parents. The one who appreciates us more than even our parents is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third gift that he was given was Surah Yusuf. The gift of Surah Yusuf was given at the Prophet's lowest point. This is why Umar radiallahu anhu, it was his sunnah. That when the people, when the sahabas were experiencing pain and anguish in a gathering, he would say, فَقْرَأُوا Surah Yusuf. Read Surah Yusuf and it will bring comfort to you. Or Abdullah al-Masood used to say very beautifully, مَا قَرَأَ سُرَةُ يُوسُفُ مَحْزُونَ إِلَّا سُرِّيَ عَنْ There's not a single person who is grieving and is in pain except that, except that when they interact with Surah Yusuf, Allah brings them ease. Allah brings them comfort. It was the Surah that was given to our Prophet when no father, no mother, no wife, no, no support system was there. And Allah said, well, I got your back. Let me show you what your brother went through. And hence the Prophet of Allah was given the story of Yusuf as a support system. That when I am struggling in my, in my moments of pain, if the Prophet who struggled more than all of us was given Surah Yusuf, imagine what it could do for you and I. The perspective that it can show us. Where Ali anhu says, anyone that wants to understand Qadr, yes the philosophy and the theology and the text of it is all important the concepts are unique and nuanced but he said if someone really wants to understand with their heart what qadr is all about and the predestiny and all of this qada that we're talking about now what's happening in gaza if someone really wants to understand it just read surah yusuf just read it where a child that was left for ruins becomes the king that is the one returning the ass that is being asked of him He's the one that is filling up the bags of those enemies of his. He's the one that is saying, well, who, do you know who I am? This is Allah's qadr that no one can see. Ali radiallahu anhu says in a beautiful narration, that if Allah was to give you and I the, the blessing or the chance and the opportunity of writing our own qadr, each and every one of us, write your own qadr the way you want to write it. 
where I want to live, where I want to be, what I want to earn, everything, write it yourself. It's your script. Write it. And then Allah showed us the qadr that He has written for us. He says there will not be a single person except that they will choose the qadr that Allah had written for them. Because our writing of whatever we are writing will be limited to our knowledge. And Allah is alim and Allah is hakim. So this surah was given at that moment as a source of, com of comfort and support to the Prophet And of course Yusuf being one of the greatest prophets was the Prophet of Allah. So Allah وسلم, when he was asked, Man akramun nas, who is the most honorable person? Who is the most honorable person? And the Prophet of Allah responded by saying, Inna akramakum indallahi atqaakum, which is the ayah of the Quran, that the most honorable are those that have taqwa. The Sahaba said, no, 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 no. Lasna ala We're not asking about this. We're asking, Man akramun nas, who is the most honorable person? The Prophet responds by saying, well, the most honorable are those who were the most, who were the most honorable in jahiliyyah, and then they entered into Islam, and Allah gave them the understanding of Islam. Khiyarun fil jahiliyyah, khiyarun fil Islam ila fuqihu. So no, 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 we're not asking about this. We're asking about who was the GOAT, like who was the most honorable person? The Prophet of Allah said, well, in that case, if you're asking me about an individual, Yusuf al karim Ibn al karim Ibn al karim Ibn al khalil The most honorable person, by virtue, of course, the Prophet of Allah will not say his own name, like someone asks you, who's the most honorable? I think me. Like, brother, like, <laughs> I'm not, I wasn't even insinuating that. But I guess that's what we're living in, right? Um, the most honorable person, Yusuf, who was the honorable. The son of the honorable being who? Yaqub. The son of the honorable being Ishaq. The son of the beloved friend of Allah being Ibrahim alayhi salam. So he gave, he spoke about Yusuf alayhi salam in, in very honorable and respectful ways. Even when he saw him in Isra and Mi'raj, he came back to the people in the Sahabas and he spoke, he didn't speak about any prophet. The only prophet that he like highlighted was Yusuf alayhi salam. He said, I entered upon the fourth sky and there he was, the man who was given half the beauty of the world, was Yusuf alayhi salam. So the Prophet salam, whenever he spoke of him, was with nothing but honor, respect, like how he spoke about the other prophets as well. We move forward, the first part of the surah is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَصِ We are narrating to you the most beautiful of stories. بِمَا أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ From the stories that we have revealed to you in the Qur'an, وَإِن كُنْتَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ لَمِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ Know that prior to this, you were amongst the ones that did not know. Three things in this ayah. The first is the word qassa. The word qassa in Arabic means what? Anyone? This is one of those layups. Easy answer. They told me people in like Berkeley, Bay Area are like top, top people, intelligent. So what's qassa? Stories. Yeah, there's no trick. It's just stories. Qassa is stories. But the actual word qassa in Arabic means footsteps. It actually means footsteps. فَوَجَدَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمَا قَصَصَ that when Musa alayhi salam and Yusha, they left that fish, they walked on every step of theirs to find it. So the reason why it's called story is because you're walking through someone's footsteps. Where Allah is saying, نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ Let me walk you through someone's life. Let me walk you in someone else's shoes to teach you what did Yusuf alayhi salam go through to give you a sense of comfort. This usage is only, it only takes place twice in the Qur'an. Because in other stories, Allah does not reveal the whole story at once. Over here, the, the word naqussu is being used because the entire story is being given to the Prophet all at once. This also shows you where the Prophet's heart was. If you gave him half of it, it wouldn't have supported him. He needed the whole story. That this is what happened to Yusuf alayhi salam. In the second place that it comes, anyone want to give a guess? One more time that it comes in this, in this variance. Naqussu. The word Qasas comes a lot, but Naqussu. Surah, Surah Kahf, mashallah. Are you a Zaytuna? Mashallah, that's why. There you go. Alhamdulillah, shout out. Um, naqussu comes in Surah Al Kahf. Nahnu Naqussu alayka naba'ahum bil haqq. Where Allah spoke about the sleepers of the cave, where He also gave the entire story at once. He walked us through their footsteps. So Allah begins with that, and then He says, Bima awhayna ilayka hadha al Quran. From all of that which we have given to you, number two, number three, the condition of being able to benefit from revelation is to keep this in mind. That prior to us 
interacting with it, we did not know. We don't come hoping that our preconceived notions of what is true and what is false has to be supported by the Qur'an. Well, our preconceived notions of what the, truth and what the truth is and what right is and what wrong is, is relative. And the only truth is that which Allah has given us. That we don't come interacting with the Qur'an or revelation as if we already know. Sometimes we hear a hadith or we say an ayah and say, that's what I thought too. Like, it's like someone telling like Elon Musk, yeah, that's what I thought too about electric cars. Like, brother, just chill. Like, you're validating it doesn't add value to me. There's no comparison to Allah. Al-Aliyul Azim, Aliyul Kabir. But us coming with our limited minds saying, that's what I thought too. No, that's what Allah taught me. In kunta min qablihi lamin al ghafilin. Sometimes we hear a verse or a story or a hadith that we've already heard before, and before the khatib or the person speaking can even finish, we're checked out. I've already heard this one. I've already heard this one. That is directly not disrespecting the speaker. It's disrespecting the actual hadith. The Prophet of Allah repeated many a hadith to his companions. They never responded like, I already heard that one. I already got that one on lock. Because and this is the condition of learning, is to act like we've never heard it. If we, the story of Musa alayhi salam comes 35 times in the Quran. There is no human more intelligent than the Prophet of Allah. But he's given the story multiple times because each time the impact is being directed towards something else. And that is the beauty of listening to wahi or hadith, that if we listen to it as if it's our first time, each time we will take something new from it. Each time we'll take a new benefit from it. That's number three. The story continues where the son sees a dream. It qala Yusuf li abihi. So there's five lows and five highs. So the first low is beginning. The son says to his father, Ya Abati, in a most respectful, beautiful tone, O oh my beloved father. Even the way that Allah speaks about how he called his father was with respect. Though he was in a sense of anxiousness and he was vulnerable, he didn't let his vulnerability be a reason for him to become disrespectful. We oftentimes say that our emotions, it, it wasn't me, it was just the situation that I was in. A believer's emotions are not sporadic. Their responses are very confined. That it's not based upon how our day was, it's based upon the ethics and values that were taught to us in Sunnah. Ya Abati, O oh my beloved father, inni ra'itu ahada ashara kawkaba. I saw 11 stars, the sun and the moon. I saw them prostrating to me. And he said, ra'itu twice. He could have said it once, but he said it twice, which was a subtle indication that he understood that what he saw was something very special. I saw them part, like he said, I saw 11 stars, sun and the moon. It would have been okay if he said, prostrating to me. But he said, I saw 11 stars, sun and the moon. I actually saw them prostrating to me. And hence the father never attempted to even interpret the dream. Neither did the son ever ask. Because they understood that this was a unique special dream. When, and then he goes on and says, Oh father, I saw this dream. And the father responds by saying, Ya Bunayya. The son was only comfortable enough to, to speak to his father with so much respect because the father spoke to him with so much love. Ya Bunayya. Oh my beloved son. I know every culture has a different way of showing love. So there's, everyone has a different way of showing love. But Ya Bunayya. Oh my beloved son. Oh my respected son. In the Qur'an, there's only three times where a father speaks to a son. And in each one, Allah mentions that they use the word, Ya Bunayya, with love and respect. In Urdu, they say, Sabko apni izzat piyari hoti hai. Which means that everyone enjoys their own self-respect. Even, even a kid, even a child. Says, ya Bunayya, la taqsus ru'yaka ala ikhwatik. Don't tell your brothers this dream. How old was Yusuf at this point? Mufassir won't have a scale between the age of 7 to 18. The more accurate one is between 7 to 13. Don't tell your brothers about this dream. They'll make a plot. It's not your brothers. It's shaitan. It's not your brothers. I'm not putting the blame there. I'm just telling you that shaitan will get the better of them. So it's better that you don't tell them. The intelligence of Yusuf was such, and his level of maturity, that he didn't ask his father why. Like, you're telling your son something so sensitive 
that you know your blood brothers? I don't want you to tell them this dream. Like, if you tell a 13-year-old kid this, he's like, what do you mean don't tell my brothers this dream? He understood that there is some wisdom in it, I won't ask why. The why is not always the most important question in the room. Though we're taught that in all of our schooling systems. When it comes to revelation, the how is more important. How quickly can I implement it? How can I be someone who implements this command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Not the why. The why comes later on. But nonetheless, he gives him this, he gives him the command and also shows the father had a lot of trust in him. Like I'm telling you something so sensitive, I know you can handle it. Though you're a kid. The story continues that obviously the brothers found out. The question becomes, how did the brothers find out? Answer number one, it slipped. He was a kid. After some time, it slipped. As kids, they were, I mean like kids, you never tell a kid a secret, right? Because at the end of the day, they're going to tell someone. Right? Number two, the potential option that At-Tabari gives, rahimahullah, is that no, no. They heard, they overheard them speaking. And when they ever overheard it, they heard the dream, they heard the response, and that's why they knew. But nonetheless, regardless of how they found out, anything which Allah doesn't mention, I'm going to use the word, it's not necessary detail. Because if it was important, Allah would have mentioned it. They found out. And when they found out, what's important is what they said. How can Yusuf and his brother be more beloved to our father than us? That's the problem. We gotta deal with the problem. Uqtulu Yusuf. Kill Yusuf. Awitrahuhu ardan. Or get rid of him in a land that is far away from us so we don't have to deal with him. Yahlulakum waju abikum. Watakunu min ba'dihi qawman. Salihin. Three parts in this ayah that I wanna focus on. Three parts. The first is the claim of the brother saying, Uqtulu Yusuf. Like, what must have happened for someone who is your own blood to even have the audacity to say, kill your brother? That, my friends, is hasad. That is jealousy, a crime that bears sin even before you act upon it. There are only two things that the Prophet ﷺ spoke about that they hold a sin even if there's no amr. We've been taught that a sin is only a sin once you do it, commit it, or else till that point, it's not a sin. But hasad, jealousy, is so venomous that even the thought of it and the feeling of it is actually a sin. And number two, arrogance. That just the feeling of it, when the, when the Prophet was asked, what is arrogance? He didn't say it's an amal. He said, بطر الحق وغمت الناس. It's a feeling that I'm always right and there's no one better than me. It's not even an act yet. The act comes later. But it's already a sin. So hasad is what drove them here. And of course, there was years of build-up. Imam Ghazali rahimahullah says very beautifully that in order for an act, in order for an act to become an act, everyone goes through a natural four-step process for that act to actually take place. The first one is hem. The reason why this is important in this tafsir is there was a lot that happened before this that could have avoided the statement, that could have helped avoid the statement. But they went through the four-step process. Number one is hem. Hem in Arabic means like a fluttering thought, a passing thought, where hem, I, you saw a billboard, we saw an ad on YouTube, whatever, it was a hem. I saw an ad of a car, I want that car, but then it's gone. That's called hem. Now, if a person doesn't defeat that hem, it sticks around for a little longer and it lingers. And it comes back in different ways. Like, oh, I don't, you know when, some, when, you, when a person has like this feeling that someone else doesn't like them? It's a hum. What happens? The way they sit, I knew they don't like me. The way they meet them, I knew they didn't like me. That's not them, that's, that's hum. We're letting the hum get the better of us. The next step, if a hum is not pushed away, it's why the Prophet of Allah taught us, when a negative thought comes, we say, A'udhu Billahi min shaitan al-rajim. In one narration, we blow on our left shoulder. One narration, we, re we recite Surah Fatiha. All of this is not to remove the act, just the thought. Because the thought will grow and it will cement itself in someone's heart. So the next part is that after hem comes this concept of niya, Where a person says, you know what? I think it's a good idea to buy that car. Just a niya, intention. The next stage is irada. Where a person actually starts to, begins to plan for it. Imam Ghazali says irada 
is to bring all the asbab together. Like, let me get my finances right, let me figure out how to get a loan, and so on and so forth. And number four is azam. Azam means case closed. There is nothing that will undo my decision. I'm, I'm set on this. It doesn't matter what, an example of azam is like it's Friday night in the Bay Area, or Saturday night, and the youngsters saw something like, you know what, we have to go, to, like positive obviously, they saw like this new masjid. And they made intention that in a Saturday night, we're going to go to that masjid. And they just had a hum. The hum stuck around. It became what? Niyyah. Then they made irada. They planned it together with their friends. And after irada, they made a azm. So one friend is picking the other friends up. They're sitting in that car. They're driving to that specific spot. On the way, the car breaks down. And the, there's no, the, car, the car is done. What azm is, and the power of azm, but also the, 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 the fear factor of azm is such... That what it does to this person at that moment, it says, well, it's all good. No car. We got to support the economy. Let's get an Uber. Because it's azim. There's azim. But guess what? There's somewhere in, somewhere in the middle of the bay where there is no Ubers. Say, yeah, it's all good. We've been missing leg day for the last month anyways. Let's just what? Walk. God has given me legs. This is a sign that I should be walking. This is what happens to a person that no clear sign is clear enough to stop the person. It's zayyana, Allah says, it zayyana lahum shaytanu a'malahum. That now at this point, shaytan has beautified that thought so neatly in this person's mind and heart that if you brought a sign saying that it's haram, it won't stop them. Because now they'll have a justification. No, no, no. This is not what it really means. What happened to these brothers was azam. It was azam. Like they had many chances to not do anything. Because they didn't know what to do. And later on in the story we find out they actually had no plan. They just had an azam. And azam is very powerful. It drives a person towards positive things or negative things. So they go ahead and say, let's kill Yusuf. That's number one. Number two, they say, lakum wajhu abikum. This is like so interesting. Because it sounds like us. Shaitan will teach us how to use a positive outcome to justify a negative process. Where we're taught that the ends justify the means. It's all good. You know what's going to happen after I get this thing done? Oh my God, I'm going to do this for the Muslim community. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. Like the ends in our beautiful religion do not justify the means. The means is what we call sharia. It's already been given to us. We want children, family, here is the means. We want wealth, here is the means. Everything that, that has an intended outcome already has a prescribed process. There is nothing left for creativity outside of that. A person, what they said was something so virtuous. We want to get rid of our brother simply because we want our father to love us. Like parents were like, please, not in that extreme. But like, please, like, I want my children to love me. Like imagine the children fighting over the father's love and the mother's love. They had such a virtuous intended outcome that our father's going to love us. It makes sense. It's okay. It's okay. I have to do this haram only once. But after this, it'll be okay. The justification for sins can never be that it was worth it. Or it made sense. The best justification for our weakness, my dear friends, where Allah taught us, is a, claim to, is a claim to weakness. That I was just weak. There is no logic or rationale that can put it into a nice, you know, package and say, oh, it's okay. When Adam alayhi salam ate from the tree, what did he say? Valamna anfusana. I was weak. I mean, if we were Adam, if I was Adam, I would say, Ya Allah, look, I'm not saying that what I did was okay. That's how we start. I'm not saying what I did was okay, but hear me out. There's always, there's always two sides of a story. Hear me out, O Rab. You made this shaitan dude for the entirety of humanity. And now it was a one-on-one -on -one battle. <laughs> like, how am I supposed to? I already thought about this. If I was Adam, I'm like, yeah, Rab, like, come on. You made him for everyone. And you had me one-on-one -on -one against him. That's not cool. <laughs> like, and I, you told me not to eat. You know what we always said? Hear me out, O Rab. He told me not to eat from the tree. I mean like, which tree? 
Which fruit? I didn't know is that. Now I know. Now I know. Now I, now I won't do it anymore. That's yahlulakum waju abikum. To always find the process to be secondary. Because the outcome is primary. That's capitalism. That's not Islam. Islam, the process is more important than the outcome. And the last part of this ayah is actually what always gets... Ibn Kathir has a whole passage on this. وَتَكُونُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِ قَوْمًا صَالِحِينَ You know what this means? آخری مرتبہ کر رہا ہوں My last time I'll do it. I won't do it again. And now I'm going for Umrah for my watch. When I come back from Umrah, you won't recognize me. Yeah, because you have a bald head. That's about it. Right? Nothing else. I mean, I just came back. I had a short layover in, in, in Medina, in Mecca, after Jordan, after like a few hours. But the idea like, oh, it's, it's okay. I'll just, you know, I, when I go for Hajj, I'll change. Allah's mercy and forgiveness should not be misunderstood. Allah's mercy and forgiveness is not empowerment to sin. It's not empowerment to sin. It's motivation to seek forgiveness after the sin. Allah doesn't empower us to sin. Na'udhu billahi min dhalik. That it's okay, karo, just do whatever you want. That's not Allah's forgiveness, Allah's mercy. There's no such thing as premeditated tawbah. Like, we premeditate the sin and the tawbah. It's like, I'll rob the bank but give it into charity. Does it make sense? It's oxymoronic. Right? So that's what they're doing. That afterwards, wallahi, after this, we're going to become such pious people. وَتَكُونُوا مِنْ بَعْدِي قَوْمًا صَالِحِينَ we have no crime on us. But one lie leads to another lie. One sin leads to another sin. And it just continues and continues until Allah forgives us. Inshallah, we are amongst those people that even if we do have premeditated, premeditated tawbah, Allah will still forgive us. Allah is kareem, Allah is rahim. But the usul in the principle is true. That premeditated tawbah is not tawbah. That we can... Plan the crime and plan the tawbah after it. Yes, Allah will still forgive. Allah is kareem. Allah is rahim. But it's not the process which, is bit, which, which has been taught to us. Nonetheless, one of them stands up. minhum. One of them stands up and says, Hey, hey, that's enough. لا تقتلوا Yusuf. Don't kill Yusuf. If, if you want to do something, put him inside of a well. One person stood up and that's why we have the story of Yusuf. One person. Oftentimes we say, what can one person do? What can I do if I share the stories of Gaza on my feed? What can I do if I only have 20 bucks to share for the people of Gaza? What can I do if all my siblings are all so messed up? How can I make my parents happy? That is also a way of shaitan defeating us. Where he makes our worth feel incapable. No. Allahumma ni a'udhu bikim al-ajzi wal kasr. Well, I seek refuge from feeling that I am incapable. Every one of us, our voice matters. We, don't, we are not responsible for the outcome of deen. We're responsible for that which we are questioned for. We will only be asked about what our liability has. So we're not going to be asked about why this never stopped. We're going to be asked about what did you do when you saw it? What did I do when I saw it? Our line of questioning will be confined to what our liability was. And what, how much we could have done. One person stood up. We are not responsible for the outcome. Actually... In the Qayyim Rahimullah says under this verse that this shows us that if we actually thought that we were like we were able and we were large in number and that's why we did something that means we've misunderstood Allah's power because just because we're large in number doesn't mean anything to Allah Allah says كَمْ مِنْ فِيَةٍ قَلِيلَةٍ غَلَبَتْ فِيَةٍ كَثِيرَةٍ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Large groups were defeated by Small groups, but one person stood up. And once upon a time, I'm sure, there was one person in the bay who decided to pray Salat. And now we have so many masjids. There was someone in your MSA that decided to establish a musalla. Now you have a musalla. If everyone said there were only one person, then nothing would have ever happened. So Qala Qail is the eldest brother. The eldest brother stood up and he said, you're not killing him. If you want to do something, go ahead and throw him, in go throw him inside of a well. The story continues where they come to the father. And this is the first law, the betrayal of their brothers. The first law is the betrayal of their brothers. I want to get, I want to get through two laws before Isha Salat, inshallah. The first law is they come to the father and say, Oh my father, like, Yusuf. Why don't you trust us with Yusuf? Like if I was a dad, I'd say, well, <laughs> obvious reasons, <laughs> right? He's a father, he is also a shafiq. And he also wants to keep the family in what? Intact. 
That's his goal. Why don't you trust us with Yusuf? We are his well-wishers. We are his protector. You know when you compensate? Like, I love him so much. I, like, what, something, something wrong? Like, why do you keep using those, like, you know, heavy statements to build your claim? We love him. We'll protect him. The father says, no, no. I know, but you know, I'm, I'm afraid if I let Yusuf go with you, he's so small that when you start running and playing in your games and fun, that perhaps a wolf will come and eat him. And the brother said, no, no, how is that possible? In You're telling us that a wolf will eat our brother when we're there? Oh, You're telling me someone can bully someone while I'm there? No way. Well, it just happened. Our support for people is not dependent upon how close they are to me. It's about how close they are to Allah. And that is the only way Allah's support comes to us. We can't only choose to use our voice in places where it has an incentive for me. It has to have an incentive for deen. Allah did not give us a reward of loving one another for the sake of each other. Tahaba lillah. That our love and our support for one another is because of Allah. Man ahabba lillah. We love each other for the sake of Allah. And that gives us reward. So the guy, the, 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 how is that possible that a wolf will eat him? Oh Father, we're here. Hamhe. We're here. What can happen when we're here? And of course, the back and forth, and the father finally lets Yusuf go. One question could be that why did the father let Yusuf go? If he was a prophet and he also had intuition of a father. Like one is wahi, and the closest thing to wahi is the intuition of a mother and a father. Right, like he had intuition, and hence he told his son not to tell the dream to the other sons. So why did he let him go? And the simple answer that is given by Ikrama, rahimahullah, the, the student of Ibn Abbas, is that the father, at the end of the day, understood that nobody can stop the decree of Allah. Like it doesn't matter how many times they say no, it's either they will take him and throw him somewhere, or they will kill him inside of my house. There comes a point where we realize that we are at the end of the day makhluq. And we are da'if. And it's not paralyzing. It's simply accepting the fact that there is someone who is in control, who has more power, more wisdom, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes we hold on for too long. We're holding on for too long that sometimes this thing happens and may Allah protect our children, but sometimes it happens with our own children. That we have multiple kids, but one kid Allah has challenged us with him where he is further away from deen and we put all of our energy towards that child. And I'm nobody too. Preach about this. I only have a two year old, a three year old. But the idea becomes that we can't stop our entire life when we have other responsibilities. Yes, that's a challenge. May Allah protect us from that challenge. Oh Allah, do not test us in our deen. Allah, oh Allah, don't make our biggest challenges in our deen. Make it in our dunya if you're going to test us, not in our deen. So he couldn't stop the qadr of Allah. And it had to move on. And that is an answer which most Mufassir don't give. The others say, that the father, at the end of the day, did not know about something happening. He simply had what? Thoughts and feelings. But thoughts and feelings are not conviction. These are thoughts. Everyone has thoughts. You can't consider our assumptions to be equivalent to yaqeen and conviction. So they go. They move forward and they take Yusuf alayhi salam. Allah in the Quran does not speak about the actual cruelty that took place with Yusuf. He doesn't speak about the fact that they carried him up the hill, that Yaqub Salam's house was in the bottom of the hill. Imam Qurtubi narrates the story very beautifully. On the bottom of the hill, and the brothers carried Yusuf on their shoulders, as if they're caring, him, caring for him, and they love him, they're holding him on his shoulders. And the moment, and the father is seeing Yusuf being taken from him. And we have to understand, the love that Yaqub had for Yusuf was not a normal love. It was a unique love. A love that made him lose his eyes. He lost his eyesight from how much he loved Yusuf alayhi salam. His entire focus was his son Yusuf alayhi salam. And he's been taken away from him and he's helpless. You know, I met these mothers in these, in these camps, these Syrian mothers that were in these Jordanian camps, Zara, thousands of people in that camp. And when you would ask them, what do you want? One mother said to us, I just want Similac. I just want Similac. Because I have no milk to feed my children. The, the, the feeling of 
being powerless when you are relied upon is extremely difficult to deal with. Like, people need you, but you, you can't do anything. This is what we call ajz. Allah protect us from being ajz. Allah has tested us with being asked to give. May Allah protect that a day comes that we are the ones having to ask. Everyone's challenge is different. Everyone's fitna is different. But the father is seeing him leave and he can't do anything. I'm, not sure, I'm sure some of your children have studied in different universities and so on and they left their home. We used to leave our, we left our home for about 10 to 12 years. Every time you leave your parents, it's like, it's an emotional train wreck. Because you won't be back for at least four to six months when you study overseas in Pakistan or wherever you're studying. That's a, it's a big challenge for a mother to just leave the son or daughter knowing that nobody's trying to kill him or her. They're going for their own betterment, but yet that separation creates anxiety. So imagine what Yaqub is going through. So they take him up the hill, and the moment they reach the top of the hill where Yaqub's eyesight has been blocked, the brother that was holding him throws him to the ground. And he drops him. They say that his, Yusuf's back was hurt till the end of his life because of this. And they kicked him. So he, again, children are innocent. And he has no knowledge of this. He, like, he has not caught wind of their evil plans. He goes to the next brother, can you carry me? The next one, the next one, the next one. And finally one of them says, you want help? Ask the 11 stars, the sun and the moon. And then he says, ah, that's why my father said, don't tell you the dream. And they carry him. One of the brothers tried to help. The eldest brother's name was Yehuda. He was the same brother that spoke up. Where he said, no, that's enough. Stop it, man. We've done our part. Let's go back. But the power of Azam. Nope, we have to do it now. But look, it, isn't it too much now? No, we have Azam. We have Azam. Azam removes rationale. It removes rationale. There's no plan in place, but I know, what, I know where I want to get to. I don't care how I get there. How I get there doesn't matter. But even if I have to become wealthy to create poverty, it's okay. That's azam. So they take him and they tell the oldest brother, if you don't stay quiet, you're going to go there too. So you better back off. And they continue to throw him inside of the well. The lengthy story talks about them taking his shirt off and then throwing him inside of the well, beating him, then throwing him in the well. Of course, Jibreel coming before he could fall in the well and holding him and then teaching him du'as, such as, La ilaha illa anta subhanak. Inni kuntu min al That now ask Allah. Don't ask your brothers for help. They can't help you. Only ask Allah. Everyone is dependent upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So ask. Ask Allah. Don't ask these people. They now leave him and return home. Allah in the Quran though does not mention any of this. What does he mention? He mentions this. When they went with him, when they took him, and they agreed upon throwing him inside of the well. So Allah speaks about their intention and what their plan was. But He doesn't actually highlight their crime because of the fact that they were afterwards forgiven. The vulgarity, like in our, in our, in our norms of, of art and literature, like sometimes eloquence can only be felt through some level of vulgarity. Oh, I had to because the picture wasn't clear enough. So I had to say it like this. Like, why would you draw it like this for? It's, it's me being artistic. No, it's not. That's actually vulgarity. That's not being artistic. Allah doesn't use unclean language, unpure language. In Allah, طيب لا يقبل إلا طيب. Allah only, even when He's speaking about a crime, He uses clear and pure speech. So He doesn't speak about their crime because they were forgiven. And once someone is forgiven, we don't have the right to keep. Bringing it up, like 10 years later, remember that one time what you did to me? I thought you, and I forgive you, but you remember that time? Like, if you forgave me, why do you keep bringing it up? I only didn't invite you to the wedding because that one time, you didn't invite me, but I thought you forgave me. I did, but still, like, it's not forgiveness. We don't have, the, we don't have to forget, but forgiveness means that we give that person their rights. Forgetting is in the hands of Allah. It takes time to forget someone's harm towards us. So, Allah doesn't mention those details. Now they come back. They come back at night time because of course shaitan's evil takes place at, at night in the dark. That's why the Prophet of Allah taught us that after Isha there should be no unnecessary occupations. Either we're worshipping Allah or either we're just going to sleep. Now they continue. Inshallah today's gathering we're worshipping. 
No, don't use that against me, right? They come crying to their father. Not every teardrop is a sign of grief. Like this is fake. Not everyone that's speaking for us right now is with us. There's nifaq all across the world, like how it is over here. They're coming crying. Oh, Father, inna. Now, as they're crying, the father sees them crying. So why are you crying for? And you know when you're trying to act like you're very, very sad, you can't even what? Speak, you're like, oh, I can't, I don't know what to say. The father then sees, have a few minutes, how much minutes? What time is, uh, uh, can I just finish the story? Is that okay? What time is Iqam, 8.15? 8 o'clock, oh, subhanAllah, I apologize. So the father then says to them, actually then in that case, I'll just stop here. Is it, finish? Okay. The father then says, this is an emotional part of the story, so, he says, Aina Yusuf, Aina Thamarata Fuadi, Aina Kita'atu Qalbi. He says, Where's Yusuf? In Arabic, the word that they use is Aina Thamarata Fuadi. Where's the fruit of my heart? How in Urdu we would say, Dilka Tukra. Aina Kita'atu Qalbi. Where's, like, a piece of my heart is missing? You know, when a mother who's lost a child, she'll say, It's like a piece of my heart has been taken from me. Like a piece of me is gone. And they say, قَدْ مَاتْ أَكْلَهُ الذِّبْ That he's dead, he's passed away, a wolf ate him. And the father actually falls unconscious. Spirituality and religiosity is not a shield from feeling the impact of tragedy. Everyone feels it, the Prophet felt it. But it's an accelerator that helps us get back to Allah. But the impact is real. That's why the Prophet of Allah taught us a dua. Allahumma ya'udhu bika min al-fuja'at al-niqam. Wallah, I seek refuge from sudden difficulty, sudden death, sudden loss. Because those are very difficult to deal with. Because the heart hasn't prepared itself for it. And he passes out like how this ha even the wife of the wife of Ja'far who became shaheed in the battle of Muta. When he became shaheed, the Prophet went to Asma's house, the wife himself. And he told her that your husband has been given the glad tidings. So which ones? Because the Prophet would say glad tidings for victory and for Jannah. So ayyuhuma ihda al husnayin Which one was he given? And the Prophet said al-Jannah. And she fell unconscious. This is, it's acceptable. Then he says, he gets back up and he asks three times. And after the third time, the father says, well, if he's gone, can you at least bring me his bones? Where's his body? Is it on the bones? The wolf ate him. So where's the shirt? And of course, again, there was no plan. There was what? Azam. There were good people, and hence they were bad criminals. They went and took the shirt, they cut an animal, they brought the blood back, and they brought the shirt back to the father. And the father looks at the shirt and says, Ma min hadha? Like, I haven't seen a wolf more intelligent than this one. Like, wow. It ate the entire body of my son, even the bones? But it did not tear the shirt. This is where the Prophet of Yaqub understood that they were lying. And he said, Fasabarun Jameel. I have nothing to say to you. I will only turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll continue inshaAllah. Right after Isha Salat. Try to come back right away inshaAllah if you can. Jazakallah wa khair. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa al-aqwa tul mutaqeen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ishaf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen. Amma ba'ad. So, who can tell me what the father said when he was telling the children that I don't want Yusuf to go with you because I am afraid of what? I'm afraid that a wolf will eat him. Right? So the brothers, when they were leaving, they really did, again, they had no plan in place to tell the father this is what happened. They went without a plan, but they had commitment. So when they did finally commit the act of getting rid of Yusuf السلام, they used that same excuse against the father. That a wolf ate your son. And this is where Ibn Qayyim makes a comment where he says that sometimes we think referring to a sin can benefit someone. Rather, it's better not to even mention it at all. And this is why Imam Ghazali rahimahullah says, even in our du'as, when we make du'a, it is, it is preferred that when we're seeking tawbah, not to mention the actual sin. Rather, just to mention the fact that we have committed a wrong. You don't see Adam salam saying, Oh Allah, forgive me, I ate from the tree. رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا 
But you don't see Yunus alayhi salam saying, Oh Allah, forgive me, I left my people. He's rather he says, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al I made a mistake. Point being that Imam Ghazali says sometimes mentioning the sin can recreate the image of the sin to the point that it wants it, it will encourage you or urge you to commit the sin again. So the idea of mentioning the sin as somehow a form of encouragement can be a double-edged sword, like what Yaqub did. And just quickly, some may claim, the brother was asking right before, that since Yusuf was a stepbrother, and you know, two different mothers, Liyah and Rahila, Liyah and Rahila, Rahila being the aunt and, and Liyah being the mother, or some say vice versa, they were, they were related as well. So perhaps, was there some favoritism that came from Yaqub which became the cause Testing Is better? Okay. Was there potentially some level of favoritism that became the cause of this animosity or jealousy? Now maybe the father could have played a role in it as well I mean the first thing is we are not the like we're not we are not responsible to psych psychoanalyze prophets lives like okay yeah, Musa a.s. killed someone maybe he had anger management issues no, that's not our place. Allah didn't give us their stories for us to become their therapists, right? Similarly, Yaqub did not have favoritism. That's not true. Because, for two simple reasons. Number one, the brothers said that we want our father to love us like that again. The natural cycle of life, whoever is a younger sibling or an older sibling, they know this, if you're the middle sibling, then we just feel sorry for each other, right? Because we get stuck right in the middle. Uh, but the norm is, the parents have the first child, all the love is directed towards the first child. Second child, that love is now split. Third child, three ways, I mean the cake can, will continue being cut. And we all know that the youngest one gets the what? Gets the entirety of the cake. That is not, uh, that is not favoritism. That's being a mother or a father. Where the first kid, second kid, third kid, yeah, Yusuf and bin Yamin were the youngest ones. And they were also, and anyone that has experienced this, this, experienced this knows that when a parent or when parents are given a child after a long break, where Allah has not given them children for a long time, and after like 10 years, they're given the, bl the blessing of a child again. That love is also very different. Where the rest of the kids were above the age of 16, 22, in some narrations, Usba means they were all above the age of 30. And they're 10 or 13 years old. I mean, there's at least a minimum 10, 12 year gap, if not more than that. So th this child and Yusuf was given to, to Yaqub after all of the years where there was no child, A, and B, now he's also old. So when you're given a child at an elderly age, it's even harder. And hence the sacrifice of Ibrahim is so unique that he was given Ismail at an elderly age. So the love that he had for him was different than the love that you would have for your normal child or a child that was given to you through a no at a normal age. Now he's 80 years old, some say he's 70 years old, asking Allah for a child his entire life, now he's given it, go slaughter him. That's a different challenge. So there was no favorites, but there was a natural process that every parent and family goes through, we can't use that you know, as, as, as an ammunition against our parents or whoever it may be. Yes, we have been taught to have justice and adl in the way that we treat them. But we're not liable for how much we love them. The love can be different. That's not something we can control. Like, if someone, like, for example, if you ask your parents who's the favorite child, everyone's going to say, the mother or father will say, of course you or everyone. Right? But there may be favorites in the way that they have, in the love that they have in their heart that they can't control. Maybe it's this daughter or this son is more like me, or reminds me of this, or reminds me of my father or my mother. Like I, my brother Rahimullah passed away, his name was Abdul Rahim. May Allah bless him, give him the highest levels of Jannah four years ago, which actually made me want to study this surah more. It's what created the urge of me saying that, well, like if the Prophet could go through it, we need something too. And we came to Surah Yusuf. But a few, a year later, or less than a year later or so, Allah blessed me with a child, and his name is now Abdul Rahim. Now, hopefully, Allah gives me many more children. 
But it will be hard to say that, I mean, I don't know, I don't have more children yet. <laughs> so I don't want to preconceive the idea. But since his name is my brother's name, there may be a level of attachment that I have with him more than the others, perhaps potentially. It's the heart. It's not the physical what? Relationship. Adal is in how you deal with one another. It's not about your heart. The Prophet of Allah said to Allah in a beautiful dua, Oh Allah, I have, I, have, I have distributed my days to all of my spouses equally. But don't hold me accountable for what is in my heart for Aisha. Don't hold me. I love her more. But the days are what? Are equal. Even at the, in the last few days of the Prophet's life, he kept asking his spouses, when's the day of Aisha? Meaning that, I'm not going to tell you to take me there because you have your right. But I'm just going to indicate, and hopefully that indication is, is a signal that you can take that, you know what, I want to go there, which that's exactly what they ended up doing. So no favoritism, but just a natural cycle of life. So nonetheless, the father goes ahead and he experiences his entire pain of losing his son. I mean, to tell your father that your son is dead or has passed away, it's a heavy, it's a heavy, tall task. The father who saw this kid born, raised, the love of his life, the youngest one or the second youngest one, and then telling him that, mm, you know, he's gone. I recall my eldest brother and my, I'm number, I'm number four, so I were five. So he was the youngest, the Rahim was the youngest, I was number four, so I'm in the middle. So you know what happens to the middle child. Um, my older brother and the third one were the ones that were challenged to tell my parents. And the way they told my father was, oh, oh father, Allah blessed you with the honor of being the father of five Hufad. Right? I said, yes. And my father had not caught wind of it yet. My mother had. And then Allah bless you the honor of being the father of five scholars who studied the deen for 10 years. I said, yes. He said, then you bless you to be the father of those who also studied the Mufti program for two more years. He said, yes. So what if I was to tell you that Allah also gave you the honor of being the father of one shaheed? And this is how they told him. Now my father is a man of, uh, I mean, everything that we've learned has come from him and our mother. May Allah bless both of them. He's a man of strong faith. And again, the pain of tragedy will break anyone. And for the next 20 minutes, all he said was, what Yaqub said. First he said, you know, my beautiful son, sabrun jani, sabrun jani. Allah give me patience, Allah give me patience. And after that, of course, a acceler Iman accelerates the process of recovery. It doesn't stop the pain, but it accelerates the process of recovery. It's an insurance policy. If you don't have a good insurance policy, when you're hit by something, the recovery process is much longer. But if you have a good insurance policy, even if your car is totaled, you're not worried. Because, yeah, it hurt that my car is gone, but I'll get a new one. And that's what we believe, that if Allah took someone from us, that means he's, He is holding them for us in the, in the Akhirah. So, for sabrun jameel doesn't mean that there's no pain or grief. Like, anyone that says that Iman is supposed to stop you from crying is lying. It's not true. The Prophet cried his eyes out when Ibrahim passed away, radiyallahu an, his son. And the Sahabas were so perplexed by his emotions that they actually had to ask him, like, Awa anta, like, do you cry this much? And the Prophet said, Innaha la rahma, this is mercy. Right? The heart yearns and the eyes tear, but the tongue will not say anything against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what does sabrun jameel mean then? It means two things. Number one, la shikwa illa lillah. I will not complain to anyone but, but Allah. You only naturally. We only complain to those whom we love. We only complain to those whom we love and we trust. A sign of love and a sign of depth in a relationship is that we feel comfortable being vulnerable in front of them. Imam Ghazali says a sign of the highest level of love that a slave has for Allah is that he or she feels comfortable breaking their heart in front of Allah and speaking to Allah. يَنْكَسِرُ قُلُوبُهُمْ Like their hearts are broken and they speak to Allah in that manner where they just vent to Allah, not about Allah, but they complain to Allah. Where Yaqub later on in the surah, he says what? Ashku, bathi, wa huzni, ilallah. I complain only to Allah. If so, for example, someone that's very close to you, they'll say, why don't you speak to me about your challenges? Because a sign of love is that you speak 
to the person who you love. So a sign of love for Allah is I complain only to you. Number two, so number one, I don't complain to anyone but Allah. Number two, I never complain about the state that Allah has put me in. So I don't tell, I don't complain about the state. In other words, complain about Allah. That's why the Prophet said that Allah in the Hadith al said that my servant curses at me. And the, and the Sahaba said, how can the servant curse at Allah? And the Prophet said, because the servant or the slave curses at time. The curse at time, i.e. the curse at their situation. And the curse at the state that they're in. That's from Allah. It's like a father or mother giving you something, like a gift, like a phone or a car, and you saying, what kind of car is this? Or Allah gives us something and we say, what is this? That's Allah. That, that state has also been gifted to us. A gift in a unique way, of course, by Allah. And that's why you never see the people of Gaza complaining about Allah. The only thing that you can say at that moment that is worthy of saying is Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah is not a sign of all is good. Alhamdulillah is a sign of saying, I have nothing else to say. Like if you ask a mother or a father or a sibling or a loved one, why do you say Alhamdulillah? Because there's nothing else to say. That is the only option that I have is to say Alhamdulillah. That means that hopefully Allah, Allah's plan works out for me and, it's able, and I'm able to survive the storm that has come my way. Sabrun Jameel. And then he tells them, بَلْ سَوَّلَتْ لَكُمْ أَنفُسُكُمْ أَمْرًا Before that, سَوَّلَتْ لَكُمْ أَنفُسُكُمْ أَمْرًا The word sawwala means to beautify. Sawwala, saw, like how Samiri, the man who made that calf start you know, making noises and Bani Israel started worshipping. The cow, the beautiful, that, that story about he had dust and he threw the dust at this animal and the animal became gold and the animal started making noise and Bani Israel started worshipping the animal. When Musa a.s. was receiving revelation and he, came, he comes back down and half the nation is worshipping the animal. So he says to Samiri, why did you do it for? Like, why did you do it for? And he gave the answer that a typical 13 year old would. So what at the nafsi? I felt like it. I felt like it made sense to me. So what Yaqub says to the children is that I know you're lying. You simply made this thought. You're, you had convinced yourself that this is what happened. And you've made it true in your mind, but it's not true. But I won't keep arguing with you because we're not, good, we're not, we're not getting anywhere. Sabrun Jameel. Wallahu al-musta'an. Allah is the one that's going to help me in this situation. The second low, and I'm going to quickly get through these next few, the second low is the separation of bin Yamin. And we'll speak about this at the highs as well. One is, one is losing his other brothers that betrayed him, but the other loss that he had to deal with is a separation from his full blood brother, who are only one year apart, which is indeed a challenge because that's all they had. They only had each other. And I'm going to speak about this at the highs. The third low is that he was sold as a slave where the story continues, وَجَاءَتْ سَيَّارَةٌ that a caravan was coming by فَأَرْسَلُوا وَارِدَهُمْ So they sent there the person that was going to get the water, like the water boy. And he came and he فَأَدْلَى دَلْوَى He put his, his bucket down and as he put the bucket down, Yusuf salam saw the bucket and he what? latched onto it and he was pulled out. And as he's pulled out, the man says, Ya Bushra hadha ghulam. Oh my, this is a boy. I mean, like who puts a bucket in a well expecting a human being to come out? So obviously he was surprised. But his Ya Bushra has a depth to it. The subtlety is, hadha ghulam is a given that this is a boy. No, but it's what he's saying is, like what a beautiful boy. Ya Bushra, hadha ghulam. What a beautiful boy. Because at that time, the, the most expensive commodity was someone that you could sell. So now we can sell this child because of how he is. Hadha ghulam. Wa asarruhu bida'a. Then they hid him in their caravan. What's interesting is Ibn Abbas says that when the, when the bucket came down, Yusuf alayhi salam, who is completely relying upon Allah, did not at that moment say what? Oh Allah, show me the way. Because the bucket is what? Allah's way of saying, come take this. Meaning we use our asbab. If Allah gives us sources and resources and openings, we use them. We don't deny the, we don't deny the openings. 
If it's from Allah, we accept it. As long as it's a part of that which is permissible, we would use them. He grabbed the bucket. Though he knows that Jibreel comes down to visit him, this is my opportunity. It's like that situation where, it's not a real story obviously, but they mention this in the books of Tafsir, that a man who was drowning, as he's drowning, a ship came by and it said, the people said, hey, come on, come on the ship. And the man said, no, no, Allah is going to save me. So okay, but you sure? Like, I'm here, I can, I can save you. So no, Allah is going to save me. So okay, next ship comes, same thing, the third ship comes, the same thing happens and the man drowns. When he sees Allah, he says, oh, Allah, I thought you were going to come save me. And Allah said, well, who sent you those three ships? That's my way of helping you. Allah helps us through people. In Allah fi auni abdi ma kana abdu fi auni, akhi, Allah helps all of us through the ecosystem of each other. So one person may come from Allah to support us. Right? We're not expecting like us to have the buraq come down like the animal from Jannah to take us to Isra and Mi'raj. Allah helps in his own unique way. So he grabbed the he grabbed the bucket and he was pulled out. And now they take him all the way to Misr. Why? Because they don't want to sell him anywhere in Palestine, in Kanaan, because someone would recognize him and then things will go wrong. So they take him all the way to Misr where their journey ended and they sold him bithaman and baksin. Darahima ma'duda. They sold him for a few bucks. I mean, of course, who are we to identify the, the monetary value of anyone? But Yusuf a.s. is a very honorable person, a very beautiful person. They sold him, for, in the books of Tafsir, they say 13 dirhams or 12 dirhams, like literally a few bucks. Why would they sell him for a few bucks? Because he was then a real slave and they were afraid of being caught. It's like someone coming to you saying, brand new iPhone 15. Is that the newest one? 16, sorry. I'm, I'm, 16. That's what happens when you live in the Bay. You know all this stuff, right? Brand new iPhone 16. I know it's $1,000, $1,200, but for me, for you, just, just, just for you, $500, $400. What that means is pretty much that it's probably stolen, right? That's what it means. Just for you though. If you get caught, it's not me, it's for you, right? So because it's not, that's why they say haram money, it comes quick, but it also leaves quick. Haram money comes quick, and the barakah also ends very quick. But there's no barakah in it. So they sell him very quickly, and the person that buys him happens to be the Aziz of Misr, who is the treasurer of Misr. We always say king, like, no, he was the treasurer, the second in charge in the kingdom, right? and he was in charge of all the finance. So he was like the CFO of the entire kingdom. The, king the, the treasurer purchases him, and that's the third law, being sold as a slave. When he was sold as a slave, he looks at the people that captured him and said, in simpler words, he said, thank you, but no thank you. Like, thank you for what? Saving me, but like, you put me back into a calamity. From one difficulty to the next. And so where Ibn Khayyim Rahimullah also comments that Yusuf Salam's difficulties were not of only one category. They were spread out. Like one is Allah testing me in one way. No, he's being tested in multiple ways. The betrayal of his brothers, it's, that's emotional torment. But the physical aspect of being thrown inside of a well and beat, is a physic, it's physical torment. And then this, no, this human being who Allah has given freedom to, who also happens to be the son of many prophets, to so the most honorable person, is being made to feel like a slave. That's mental torment. So he's being tested in so many different ways. The next one is spiritual torment that's going to come later. So Allah's test can come in different ways, but the response is always the same. So now as he's sold to this, the master, he continues to live in this household and the treasurer takes care of him as if he is his own son. And he tells his wife that will take care of him because there is great things that I see in him. Like he had the farsightedness to know that Yusuf was someone special, salam. When he reaches the age of 33, normally refers to the physical uh, peak of someone's strength as a, as a human being, which is around the age of 33, hence the age of the people of Jannah is also 33. 40 happens to be the age of someone's peak of emotional strength and their intelligence. Hence, Nabuwa comes at the age of 40. So when he reaches the age of 33, his Treasurer's wife, who some of us here don't mention that her name was Zulaikha, makes a plot against him. 
and she takes him into a room and locks him into a room where there are multiple doors that lead to that room. So for example, you have the main door of the house. You know, they say it's seven doors. Well, seven doors means, it's not like one door, second door, third door, fourth door. Seven doors means like the furthest room in the house or the palace. So the first door is like the, you know, the, the door of the house, and you have another door to take you upstairs, and you have another door to take you in this hallway. That's what seven doors means. That there were multiple, there were multiple doors that led to this room that was all the way at the end of the palace. So the most, secret, the most secret covered room in the house is where she takes him. And Allah mentions over here that she She locked all the, door, all the doors. Come to me. And this is the, where the fourth challenge begins. His response is how we learn how to protect ourselves from sins even when the opportunity is staring at our face. What he does. A lot of times, as youngsters, we say, well, I had no choice. Everyone was doing it, so I did it too. I had no choice. I sat in the car, there was music on, I just listened to. I had no choice. I sat in the gathering, everyone was backbiting, I backbit too. No. Shaitan says the same to us on the Day of Judgment. فَلَا تَلُومُونِي وَلُومُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ You can't blame anyone but ourselves. So in this moment, where he's being pushed to a corner, and he's actually also being pushed by his master. So every excuse in the book to commit a sin and perhaps not even be liable for it. Because he's forced to do something which is indecent. But at that moment, he follows a three-step process. And these three things is what we're taught to do in any moment where a fitna afflicts us. Primarily, the goal is never to be in a place where we are called towards a sin. The Prophet of Allah taught the companions, Avoid these places of accusation. That's, that's a pretext. We never want to be in a place where it looks like we're committing a crime. The Prophet of Allah was walking with his wife, Safiya, anha, after Isha Salat, and the other Sahabas were walking on the opposite side of the road, and they saw the Prophet, and they continued walking, and the Prophet said, Hey, hey come, here, come here, come here. This is my wife, Safiya. It's like, well, Ya Rasulullah, we never... We never thought anything negative of you. So yeah, but shaitan flows through your body like how your blood flows through your body. So I want to make sure there's no, there's no afterthought when you go back home. So our responsibility is to uh, protect ourselves from the places of accusation. But at the same time, obviously, we are no one to accuse anyone of any, any, any tuhma, any buhtan, because that is considered to be a major sin, accusing someone of a sin. Nonetheless, the three-step process is number one. If we find ourselves in that state, if we do find ourselves in that state, the first thing is Allah. We ask Allah for support. Oh Allah, you help me in this moment. Allah, a'udhu billah. That's what it means. Oh Allah, I seek refuge through you that you support me. I don't know where I can go. The doors are all locked. Everyone that's sitting in this gathering is doing something. Ya Allah, you help me now. You find a way out for me. Understanding that in every situation, our reliance and our way out is Allah. Number one. Number two, إِنَّهُ rabbi أَحْسَنُ مَثْوَيْ Number two is remembering how this will affect your, our loved ones. Number two is thinking about how this crime will actually affect those who love us. If I was to do this, how will it affect my master? The one who brought me into this house and treated me so well for all these years, it won't sit well with him. So out of love and respect for him, I won't commit the crime. Taqwa is number one. Ma'ad Allah. If taqwa was enough, Allah would not mention the next three. There's four things, not three. There's four. If taqwa in itself was sufficient, the next three would not be mentioned. Taqwa is the base of protecting ourselves. But in itself, it's not strong enough. We need the other three as well. Number two is to actually ponder upon how this sin will affect our loved ones. If I do this as a youngster, how will it affect my parents? Is a thought that should cross our mind. As elders, how would it affect my children, my spouse, my community members? This is what becomes a natural barrier between us and the crime. Number three, لَوْلَا أَنْ رَأَى بُرْهَانَ Allah says that he saw a burhan from his Lord. 
Burhan in Arabic means proof. He saw a proof or he saw some level of, 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 of a clear sign, a bayina from his Lord that he shouldn't do it. What was the sign that he saw? Ibn Abbas says, the sign that he saw was in the back of the room, was his, anyone? Was his father. An image of his father, and his father was biting on his nails, saying, don't do it, don't do it. Because at that moment, he remembered how he was raised. How he was raised. So he thought about, again, Ra'a burhana rabbi means that the way that we raise our children in a manner of obedience, when we're with them, when we're not with them, it is as if we're still with them. That's what happened with Yaqub. So the third thing is to actually consider, so the second one was how it affects the people that, that love you. The third one is to actually reflect upon your reputation. Reputation. Reputation matters. Reputation is what actually allows us to receive certain positions. So it does matter. Now again, we're not taught to judge, but we are taught to be wary of our own deeds. So he thought about the reputation of his father, family, everyone else that gave him this position, so he turned away from the sin. Three things. The fourth one is the most important. The fourth one is after these three things that he did, what was the fourth thing that he did? Anyone? He what? He ran away. He ran away. Okay, where did he run to? Well, well, he ran to which doors? The locked doors. The doors were already, the doors were what? Locked. Sometimes you say, well, there was nowhere to go. I had no choice. We always have a choice. To do the amount that we can potentially do. Not the amount that is beyond our capability. Like, I know the door is locked, but my responsibility is to what? Leave. The fourth thing is, Ibn Qayyim says, the fourth thing is to leave that circle. Leave those friends, leave that environment, that tawbatan nasuha, which Allah refers to in Surah, Muj Surah Tahrim, tawbi Allah tawbatan nasuha. Ibn Abbas says tawbatan nasuha is to leave the place that causes the sin. Or to leave the friends that encourage the sin. That a person's tawbah is not complete until he or she actually makes a commitment not to go back to that place again. So if I know this is a cause of me thinking about the sin, maybe it's better for me not to go there then. We know the story of the man who killed 99 people. Famous hadith of Bukhari. He killed 99 people, then he goes to someone and he asks, can I be forgiven? The guy says, no, you can't. You killed 99 people. He said, well, start digging. <laughs> Here we go. 100 done, right? And then he goes to the alim or the rabbi and he asks, hey, I killed 100 people. Can I be forgiven? And the man says, well, there's potential that you can be forgiven only if you are, if you leave the city. Leaving that place is a requirement of Tawbah being complete. So in that moment, he didn't just, it's like we're sitting there and people are backbiting and under our breath and stuff. What happened next? Right? Or listen to something which is haram. This is so good but bad. <laughs> right? Like, that's not how it works. You can't have two legs, in our, you can't have, we can't have two legs on two different paths. And when we choose, we have to leave. So if I get up and leave that gathering because people are backbiting, that's, that's just what it is. That's the beauty of the truth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, قُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ The beauty of the truth is that whenever it shows up, batil in itself will stop. It will cease to exist. I'll give you an example. Like if I had like a fake Rolex, I don't, I, don't, I don't have one, I don't have a watch, I don't wear a watch as much. But I've had a fake Rolex. I was flaunting it the whole time, my fake Rolex. And no one knows it's a fake because I only have one here. But the brother comes up and he has a real Rolex. And he's standing next to me now. What am I going to do? I'm going to quickly like hide my hand behind the chair and put the Rolex away. Because now you can compare. When truth appears, it doesn't need to scream. It doesn't need to make noise. It doesn't need heavy movements. It just has to show up. al haq, zahaq al batil. What we understand, Imam Sufi Rahimullah says in this ayah that a believer is the greatest manifestation of haq. 
So wherever a believer goes, they themselves are determined of batil. So if I show up in a gathering and people are back, I'm using the simple example of backbiting. If they're backbiting, my presence is a deterrent. And if they don't stop, that means I haven't defined myself to be a representative of the truth yet. Ja'al haq. If I sit in a car and someone's listening to haram and they don't stop, that's because I haven't embodied the truth enough. It's not them, it's what? It's me because Allah's ayat and words can never be false. Ja'al haq. The presence of truth will always remove any falsehood. So he physically ran to a locked door, which is insane. Why would you run to a locked door? My dear friends, what actually proved his innocence? What proved his innocence? Shirt being ripped from the back, which could have only happened if you uh, ran away. We do our part. We are not responsible for the outcome. We are responsible if we are fulfilling our what? Am I doing my part right now? Allah takes care of the rest. He ran to the door and as he reaches the door, who opens the door? The king, the treasurer opens the door and he sees all of this. And the, and, and the wife screams out, no, no, he's the one that committed the crime. And he's the one that tried to do this to your family. What should be the crime of this person? Just because we are the first person to raise our voice doesn't make us the ultimate truth. Or doesn't give us the ultimate truth. That's not how it works. Just because we accused doesn't mean in our sharia the accusation is always going to be true. And Zulaikha's story is a prime example of that. And of course, there's always different scenarios. But she started screaming, oh no, this is what this guy did to me. And Yusuf A.S. said, no, I didn't do it. And luckily enough, وَشَهِدَ شَاهِدٌ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا شَهِدَ شَاهِدٌ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا means that there was someone in that gathering that saw the entire scene unfold. Who was there? Some of us don't say that it was the servant of the house. The servant, like the maid of the house. Like, you know, like they're doing their own stuff. So no one even thought about them. Number two, they say that no, it was a child. It was a toddler. And he was one of the toddlers that Allah gave the power to speak. So he spoke up. And he said, if the shirt is ripped from the front, then he is wrong and she is innocent. And the shirt is ripped from the back, then she is guilty and he is innocent. And of course, the shirt was ripped from the back and his innocence was proven. Quickly, what he didn't say, what he didn't say was what? What did he not say? Anyone? He could have said a lot of things, I guess. What he could have said was Yusuf is innocent. He didn't say that. He didn't say Yusuf was innocent, though he was innocent. Because one could say that that was his word against someone else's word. Innocence is proven through proof. He proved Yusuf was what? Innocent. We stand for the principle, not the personality. We stand for the principle, not the personality. The fact that the proof was there, that he was innocent, is the reason why no one can make a claim against him. It wasn't just a child saying, no, he's innocent. That's not strong enough. How do you know he's innocent? So even, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, اِعْدِلُوا وَلَوْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِكُمْ Be just, even if it's against yourself and your family. How often, as, you know, as community members and family members, does a case come to, come to us, if I'm a father or a mother, daughter-in-law, son-in-law, and we always think that our person is right. No, no, my son can't do anything. So we, have, we, we, like, we, have a, we also have, like a, we have a boarding school where we have more than 200 students that live on the campus from 35 states, part of what Miftah has is like this boarding school that we are, I've been very proud of because that's our, that's, that's the biggest, um, you know, khidmah of serving these students that are coming from all over the country, like the one that we went to. We have a lot of kids from Cali as well. Great kids, mashallah. And sometimes a kid that really messes up, you got to call the father and mother and say, hey, your son, you know, did this and that. Like as a last resort, you don't want to snitch on the kid either, but as a last resort, you have to tell the parents. So sometimes you call the parent, I'll say, you know, you know your son did this. And the first thing the mother will say, Yemena Bertania. They say, Ibni. It can't be my son. I'm like, well, his name is this? Like, yeah, but it can't be. It doesn't sound like him. I'm like, brother, I don't know if it sounds like him or not, but it is him. Want camera proof? Like, I'll show you. It's him. No, no, the camera's lying. <laughs> like, anfusikum. We stand for the truth even if it makes me look bad. Because the truth is always the loudest voice in the room. Not the person. 
doesn't matter who it is. So he proved to us the process of claiming the truth does not depend upon someone's voice. It depends upon the truth. His shirt was ripped in the back. That's all that matters. I don't need to tell you Yusuf was innocent. I'm telling you why he's innocent. So I'm removing my bias of him being the great Yusuf and I'm claiming his innocence through proof. So if I'm going to stand for someone, it shouldn't simply be because they're my brother or my sibling or my wife or husband. It's because that is the truth. Or else we are responsible for supporting perhaps an oppressor. So the story continues where the noise and the chatter reaches throughout the community. And of course, Zulaikha is a, a, a royal person in the community. And there was always seen, and even back in the days, there was what? News outlets. That this person did this to their slave. What a horrible person. How should, like, how could this even happen? And she hears it. She hears everyone's what? Talks and their taunts. So she said, you know what? You come here. I mean, by all of you. She invites 70, in some narrations, 40 of the royal women of the community. And she gathers them. And she says, you wait here. Hold this knife and hold this fruit. And just stay here. And then she says to Yusuf, you wait here. And after they're waiting there, and Yusuf is sitting in a different room, again, Yusuf is still the slave. She says to him, Ukhruj alayhinna. Now come exit and enter upon these people. He doesn't know where he's coming, but he enters. Akbarna. When they see him, they all say, What? Well, Akbarna. In simple words, mean, Oh my. I mean, it could, it could also mean Allahu Akbar. But they were not believers. But the idea is the same. Oh God. Like, oh my. Akbarna. I always tell my young brothers this, that when you go for a rishta in a proposal, and you don't get that Allahu Akbar, you got to walk out. Right? You must be delusional if you think that. Right? None of us are Yusuf. So, that's what Akbarna. And then, قَطَّعْنَ أَيْدِيَهُنَّ And then they start cutting their hands. وَقُلْنَا حَاشَ لِلَّهِ And then they say, no way. This can't be a human. In هَذَا إِلَّا مَلَكٌ كَرِيمٌ This must be a noble angel. For us, it's the opposite. They say, this can't be human. إِتُوا شَيْطَانَ قَبَتْشَهِ نَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ Right? Um, this is someone else. إِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا مَلَكٌ كَرِيمٌ This must be a noble angel. The fact that they cut their hands doesn't mean that their arms fell off. Right? Sometimes we try to create more masala than it needs to have. The Qur'an is beautiful in the way that Allah gave it to us. Qatta'a means to cut. And it does mean to cut deep. But it means to cut to the point that blood is seen. But it doesn't mean that the entire hand came off. The fact that they continued cutting till their hand started bleeding is enough of a sign of how, how, much of, how, how overwhelmed they were by the beauty of Yusuf. How in awe they were. Right? When, I, when someone, for example, years, when, I, when we were studying in boarding school, our teachers would always say, when you go home, you know, help your mother, help your father, do khidmah, do you know, support. We were kids. You go home, you forget about that. So one time, I, it hit me really hard. I said, you know what? I'm going to be a good kid. So I show up. And while I'm home, we, we, we would go home maybe two, three weeks of the year. So I come home, and I come to the, my mother, she's in the kitchen. I say, Amiji, what can I do to help you? She looks at me like, as if she was dreaming. <laughs> like, want to help me? I'm like, I, I, I mean, of course. I mean, like, I want to help you. She said, okay, you sure? Said, yeah, yeah, of course, I want to help. My teacher told me to ask, how can I help? So she gave me these few onions. and said, just cut the onions. I said, I got you. This must be very easy. Right? And I take that knife, and I... I see my mother cutting it, she cuts it like it's like, my mother, my mother's a physician, so she's not like, I'm not trying to elude that anyone should be in the kitchen, just to make it clear, right? But she was in the kitchen, she was cooking, and she, I see her cutting, she cuts as if like, it's like, you know, it's like us playing basketball, it's so easy. And I put the knife down, I cut it, and boom! yadi. <laughs> like I cut, I am a G, look! And I go crazy, like I saw blood, and I can't, I can't do blood, I just can't do blood. Right, I see blood, and I'm about to pass out and faint. And it's like one small, like, trickle of blood. It's like, you never cut your hand. And I said, no, I did cut my hand. So, qata'a means that. They cut their hands, obviously, out of the awe of the beauty of Yusuf. And when Yusuf Islam saw all of this, like the plot against him did not lessen, it thickened. 
That now it's not just Zulaikha, everyone is attempting to harm me. He says, Oh Allah, well, number four was leave the space. He says, Ya Rabb, Rabb is sijnu ahabbu ilayya mimma yad'oonani ilay. Oh Allah, prison is more beloved to me than what these people are calling me to. I'm not, I don't want to go there. I'm out, take me to prison. And Allah then enabled that process to take place where he went to prison. The Prophet of Allah, وسلم, he says in a beautiful hadith, in this story, I'm going to say, this hadith, it comes three times. Rahimallahu Yusuf. Rahimallahu Yusuf is a very beautiful way of saying, may Allah's love be upon Yusuf. Like, I love Yusuf. May Allah have mercy upon Yusuf, right? He says, if he had not said, oh Allah, prison is more beloved to me, Allah would have given him a different outlet. But he said prison, so Allah gave him prison. So our job is, فَاسْأَلِ الْعَافِيَةِ Oh Allah, you give us ease. You give me the easiest outlet. We don't confine Allah. Not that we can, but even in our du'as, we say, oh Allah, you فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ الْعَافِيَةِ Ask Allah for ease. Obviously, he said prison because that was what they were trying to do to him. So those were the two options in front of him. Commit the sin or go to prison. So he mentioned, I'd rather go to prison. And that's where number four comes. The fourth law, and I'll, and I'll quickly, after the fourth law and the fifth law, I'll give a few minutes to one of the sponsors to speak. So just, just five minutes, inshallah. But then, Naveed, if you give me, inshallah. Is that okay? Five minutes is okay? Is that okay? Inshallah. So the fourth law is he enters into prison. وَدَخَلَ مَعَهُ السِّجْنَ فَتَيَانَ Number one was what? Number one, betrayal of the brothers. Number two was Separation of Binyamin, the brothers, you guys are just moving your lips. Uh, number three was what? Sold as a slave. Number one, number one again, betrayal of their brothers. Number two, separation from Binyamin. Number three, sold as a slave. Number four, sent to prison. He enters into prison, and as he enters into prison, Allah, first of all, He highlights the fact that He enters into prison with two other youngsters. It's because their story is now attached. One of them says that inni arani a'asiru khamara that I was squeezing grapes and making wine in my dream. And the other one said that I saw inni arani ahlinu fawqa ra'si khubzan ta'kulu tayru min I saw that I was holding bread on my head and birds were eating from it. So they both mentioned their dreams and then they said to him nabi'na bi ta'wili can you please tell us what this dream means inna naraka min al-muhsineen this inna narakam al-muhsineen mufassirun have written chapters on. Inna narakam al-muhsineen. Which means we see you to be someone that despite the severity of your situation still looks like a person who is ready to help others. You are a muhsin. A muhsin is not considered to be a muhsin when he does good to those who do good to them. A muhsin is considered to be a muhsin when people do bad to them, they do reciprocate with good. The Prophet of Allah says, لَيْسَ الْوَاصِلُ بِالْمُكَافِي In the discussion of fulfilling ties of kinship, the Prophet of Allah says, a person that is equal has not fulfilled the ties of kinship. Rather, a person who is such that others tear it and they what? Try to mend it back together. That is a person who is considered to be a, a muhsin. A muhsin is not he or she that knows how to reciprocate that which they were given. That's considered to be fard. That is considered to be fard. Ihsan is to do more than what that person has done for you. That's called ihsan. What's unique about this verse is that they're saying to Yusuf, you look like a muhsin. Muhsin means someone who is in a state or in a situation that they can do something for you. My dear friend has gone our Prophet Yusuf has gone through every difficulty. He has been betrayed by his brothers, which should have already it should have stopped him there. Then he is what? Sold as, loses his binyamin, sold as a slave, thrown into prison. At this point, why would anyone, why would anyone come off as a muhsin? We have made it a prerequisite that I can only support someone or make someone happy if I'm in that state. If I'm not doing well, I can't make someone else feel well. That's not true. The Prophet of Allah was broken hearted, yet his presence was nothing but comfort for people. If, if it was a condition 
that I must be happy to be a source of other people's happiness and the Prophet of Allah had every excuse to be sulky. For us believers, the smallest things happen. Smallest things happen. And when someone looks at us and says, hey man, why are you like, why are you like that for? It's like, yo, you don't know what happened to me. You don't know my story. Okay, tell me your story. Man, I was driving and got pulled over by the cops. Ah oh, man, that's tough. But he didn't give me a ticket. So why are you so upset? Like why is it so that we have to be at a certain level to have to be a source of ease for others? It was never a condition to have in order to give. That was never a condition. It was never. When you have, it's not a condition. Now you have to give. Now it's a fard. But till that point, it wasn't a fard, but you can still what? Give. Zakat is 2.5%. That's a fard. But after that, can you still give? Yes, you can. The condition is not that you don't have, or the, the, rather that you do have. The condition is that you are in a state that can still bring someone support. That is enough to be liable for that, for that blessing. Oh, you, can't, you don't know what I've gone through. That's a quality that Allah refers to about a munafiq. خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ حَلُوعًا إِذَا مَسَّهُ الشَّرُّ جَزُوعًا That they're always in this anxious state, like how we live in America. That anything that happens, like, oh my God, the whole world is against me. Now I can't be there for you because I got to figure out my own stuff. Well, Allah tells us, or rather the Prophet of Allah tells us that if I'm going through my stuff, the process of being supported is a cyclical nature. It's an ecosystem. إِنَّ اللَّهَ فِي عُونَ عَبْدِ مَا كَانَ عَبْدُ فِي عُونِ أَخِي The Prophet of Allah taught us that Allah's support will always be there for a person as long as they are supporting someone else. The Prophet of Allah taught us إِرْحَمُوا تُرْحَمُوا that if you forgive someone, then know that Allah is also what? Forgiving you. It's an ecosystem. Imam Ghazali rahimullah says, if you want to know if Allah's help is with you at that very moment, ask yourself, am I supporting someone right now at this moment? And if my shoulder is not a source of comfort for people who are struggling in pain, then Allah's support is limited for me. If I haven't learned how to be present for people in their difficult moments, know that the support of Allah in my difficult moments will be limited. That is the sunnah of Allah. And hence, a fard of a believer upon a believer are five. Right? Saying salam to them after they say salam, responding to salam, saying alhamdulillah, responding to their invitation. I'll leave the first three alone. The last two are the most important for us. I'adatul marid, visiting the sick. Everyone wants to support the orphans in Jordan and Gaza. But how about sick people that are in the hospital or in the hospices of our own community? What if our parents reach an age that they can't move and they're stuck in a room and no one comes to see them? That is reward. To visit the sick is a source of reward. This is a fard. We have to do it. And number five, ittiba'ul janaiz. Going to a janazah. There is no condition that needs to be there for me to go for someone's janazah. It's a fard. I have to do it. If I'm available, I have to do it. And I can't not make myself available. Right? In a sense like, how many weddings have we said yes to? And how many janazas have we said no to? It's a direct sign of, I'll accept that, which brings me ease, but I won't accept that, which gloom, bring, makes, makes my day gloomy. Like, I, I can't, it's just, I can't handle it. That's halua. That's, that's, not a, that's not a believer's quality. A believer's quality is, they don't let their state paralyze them to be a source of comfort for others. إِنَّا نَرَاكَ مِنَ Muhsinin, despite what you've gone through. Lastly, we've all been taught the definition of ihsan through the beautiful hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam, right? The beautiful hadith tells us what does what ihsan means. And ihsan's meaning is an ta'budullah ka annaka taraf illam takun taraf innahu yaraq. Worship Allah as if you can see him and know that if you can't see him that he can see you. This definition is completely it's completely exclusive for worship. It has nothing to do with character and dealings. It has to do with worship. That when we worship Allah, we worship Allah in this state, it's called what? Ihsan. What is the definition of Ihsan when it comes to being a daughter or a son, or a friend, or a husband, or a wife? That is a different definition. 
And that definition, Imam Ghazali rahimullah states, and it's stated by many other scholars as well, that ihsan means an tu'atiyahu akhtaru mimma tustahaq. To give someone more than what they actually deserve. An tu'atiyahu akhtaru mimma sa'altak, mimma sa'alaka. And to give them more than what they ask you of. Imagine if spouses started using this as a metric. That I won't limit, limit myself to what my responsibility is because my responsibility is considered fard. I will actually use the metric of ihsan. I will do that which is not my responsibility. That the, the beginning of ihsan is where our responsibility ends. If we are only doing what we are responsible for, we haven't even entered the arena of ihsan. Ihsan is after. The Prophet of Allah taught us, if someone says assalamu alaikum to you, we say wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Doing more. They say wa rahmatullah, we do what? Wa barakatu. The Prophet of Allah taught us, if someone gives you a gift, that aim to give them back a gift as well that is better than theirs. Not a competition. But it's ihsan. To always do more than what the person did for you. That is what ihsan refers to. It's not doing our responsibility. It's like someone wants to be applauded for praying five times salat. May Allah give us the ability to always continue doing it. But that's a fard. Spirituality is stabilized through faraid, but it grows through nawafil. Similarly, relationships are stabilized through their faraid, but they progress through our nawafil. The relationships grow when we start doing ihsan for each other. Love doesn't grow through faraid, it's just stabilized. So the, the fact that they're saying inna naraka min al muhsinin means that we see you to be someone who doesn't need to help us, but you will still help us. And the other part of ihsan is to always take less than what you deserve. It's to always take less than what is your right. So I know this is my right, but I willingly give it up. Of course, not oppression, but I willingly, I don't, I don't want it. That's called what? Ihsan. When you have the right to take it, but you don't take it. So when they say this, and they ask, ask him to interpret the dream. The dream, which was a lengthy dream of seeing the, the, the wine and the, 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 the bread on top of the head. Yusuf salam breaks into like a full-on da'wah workshop. Like straight up. He takes that moment and takes advantage of it. He says, by the way, do you guys know who I am? Not, not who I am, but like where I got all this from. Like, you know, when people ask us for something, like, Yo, you're so intelligent, you're like a physician or like a mechanic. Like, yeah, I know, alhamdulillah. Alham I did go to Berkeley. Yeah, but yeah, how can I help you? Right? Where we always refer the virtue of ours to ourselves. Like, yeah, alhamdulillah, I worked hard. So what Yusuf Ali Salam does, number one, is, ذَلِكُمَا مِمَّا عَلَّمَنِي Rabbi. Let me make it clear to you, my dear friends, what you're asking me for, has nothing to do with me, it has to do with who? Allah giving it to me. Like what was the difference between the wealth of Arun and the wealth of Sulaiman? They both were known to be the wealthiest people of the world. One's wealth became blameworthy, the others became praiseworthy. The difference was not the wealth itself, neither how they, how they, how they actually earned the wealth. The difference was the way that they responded to the wealth. That one said, this is what? Ana ala ilmin indi. This is all me. This me that we're taught in America, right? This is all me. Whereas the other one said, well, this is all Allah. I made an effort for it, but this is all Allah. So he first teaches them that it's not from me, it's from Allah. And then he goes, gives them da'wah. I believe in the religion of my forefathers. Allah. Are many gods more beloved? Are many gods better than one God? One God is better who is all living, all, all, all powerful. And he continues to give this what? Da'wah. I mean, if I was those two brothers, I'd be like, ha. Ah, my dream? <laughs> the dream? Why did they not leave for it? Why did they just simply sit there and listen? Why? Not because they were in prison, but because of what? They still needed his dream interpretation. When someone comes to us for whatever skill set Allah has given us, that is an opportunity for us to refer them to Allah. Now, it doesn't have to be the same way he did it. <laughs> you might lose all your clients, right? But it can be done in subtle ways. Like I have some, I have some friends who work in the hospital, and they say that whenever we start treating a patient, we just say, Bismillah. Bismillah. 
And sometimes someone will what? ask. Obviously there's laws and so on and so forth. But you can stick within the parameters and still have a subtle impact. Uh, this means that I begin the name of Allah. Allah is my God. Okay. And now everything positive, and this person taught me this. He said, now everything good that I do, it's referred to Allah now. Like your religion taught you that. Versus everything good that we do, it's normally referred back to us and we know we are not worthy of that praise. Like we know that. The best part is that we know that. And Allah has the... Imam Shafi rahimahullah says, the greatest blessing of Allah upon us is that He has hid our sins from people. We know we're that person. So why would I even allude to myself being that person? I'd rather connect them to someone who is actually what? Pure. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhana rabbi al-a'la, the most pure, the most high, I refer to Him. That's what we can do. So at least they know this person that is serving them is also a Muslim. A, a process and a manner of removing Islamophobia is to allow our interactions with people that are so positive to be clear that this is also because I am what? A Muslim. And at the end of it, he says, by the way, this is what your dream meant. You don't have to do that much. Like if you're a mechanic, someone comes to you, you know, you're a mechanic shop, you fix my car. Like, by the way, do you know who makes cars? No, not Henry Ford, not Elon. Allah makes cars. But like, brother, I'm not like... It's not that deep. I just need my oil changed, right? But there could be slight indications. And how you package it is what gives it value, right? How you package your da'wah. Packaging da'wah takes creativity. And creativity is an extension of your love for someone. If, you have true, if we have true love for people, we can be very creative in how we string our words together. How we give da'wah to them. Like, it's actually an entire art how to give da'wah in the right words, the right packaging. Like, you know, an example of what's the difference between the same product that I buy from like Marshalls. You guys have Marshalls in there? I think you guys are bougie. You guys probably don't have Marshalls. You have Marshalls? You guys are normal? Okay. Marshalls, TJ Maxx. Right? Okay. You guys, okay. We're, we're, now we're talking. Right? Marshalls. In that same bag, that Louis Vuitton bag, buying that same bag or watch from where? The actual store. The price is very different. Right? It's like a fraction of the price. Same product, different price. Why? Any marketing students here? Sales? What's the difference? Huh? It's the same, same name brand. It's the same thing. Because Marshall sells name brands, right? Oh, no, the same, the same model. Yeah, it's good. Zara, you remember this one? Okay, great. MashaAllah. You heard it, you heard it where? From, but which, where was this? In Sira? MashaAllah. Sister, uh, she studied at Zaytuna, but her family is actually from Puerto Rico. MashaAllah. And she came all over here to study. May Allah bless her and bless her family and continue to protect their faith. And all your friends and everyone that came, alhamdulillah. But yeah, so it's the packaging. When we buy that thing from Marshalls, we get rid of the bag really quick. <laughs> like, where'd you get it from? Man, who cares? It's Louis. Calvin, Calvin. <laughs> you know, so what are we talking about where I got it from? Who cares where I got it from? But when you buy it from the store, Louis Vuitton, we take a picture of the package before what's inside the package. Even though what's inside of it is probably like a keychain. <laughs> but the idea is it, the, pack, the, brand, the packaging creates so much more value for it. And our mothers probably still have that bag somewhere to give a gift in it to someone else, right? Because the packaging does that much for us. How do we expect people to accept our da'wah when we package something so pure in a marshal's bag. It doesn't work. It's something so pure. If it's not packaged properly, the person that you're giving it to will not value it. If I'm packaging it whilst being a friend that is always lying and cheating and being dishonest, then that's my packaging. It won't have an impact. So Yusuf Islam has an impact on them. Then he interprets the dream, which is obviously one of you will be free, the other one will be what? Found to be? Uh, uh, found to be convicted and you will be killed. You will be, you, you will be killed for your crime. The one who is going to be freed, he said, hey man, when you go out, tell your king that I'm innocent. Just like, tell him that I'm innocent. Because he was innocent. He just, he's using his asbab as he thought. And Allah did not approve of this. So he remained in prison for seven years after this. Or, bid'a sinin means between seven to thirteen. But the most Mufassirun say he was in prison for seven more years. And this is why we know that he received prophethood in the well. Because when he went to prison, he was 33. 
and he came out at least at, at least at the age of of 40, which means that he became a prophet whilst he was inside of prison. Why did Allah make him forget? Because now Yusuf السلام, who has gone through all of this, he first was expected to ask Allah and then to seek help from someone else. But he first turned to the person, not as seeking help, just as an indication that, hey, help the brother out. But someone of that level of piety was expected to hold a, a higher standard. Hasanatul Abrar, Sayyatul Muqarrabin. As Ibn Hajj rahimullah would say, that the good deeds of normal people are considered to be sins of pious people. Where Abdullah ibn Mas'ud anhu, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the great companion, one day he was sitting with the companions, the tabi'in, like the students, and he said to them, you know the things that you consider to be like good deeds? We would consider those to be the deeds of munafiqs. Like no flex though. <laughs> he says, the, what, what you consider to be like all high and mighty, that's what munafiqs would do. Like Fajr and Isha in the masjid. <laughs> that's what he was saying to them. Like, that's not a big deal. Because they were of a higher caliber and a higher status. So the fifth low was that Allah kept him in prison. So he wasn't able to get out. First law was betrayal. Second law was losing Binyamin. Third was slave. Fourth was going to prison. The fifth was staying in prison. I'm going to do the five highs. The five highs don't take as much as time as the five lows, inshallah. Bismillah ar rahim So inshallah we move on to starting the highs. And inshallah within the half an hour that I have, we should be able to cover the five highs. The journey of the highs begins with the dream once again. And the dream is the king sees سِمَانٍ يَأْكُلُهُنَّ سَبْعٌ عِجَافٌ That there are seven fat cows are being eaten by seven skinny cows. And then there are also seven years of seven, seven different um, uh, plains that are filled with greenery. And there are seven different fields that are dry and they have no cultivation and they have no greenery. So when the king sees his dream, he turns towards his council and he says, tell me what the dream means. And they all respond by saying, Adhagatu ahlam. These are not dreams. These are a fraction of your imagination. This is not real. Just let it be. Don't, don't think of it too much. After seeing it for three days, and some say seven days, he says, no, this dream means something. And the man that was now the wine bearer of the king, he wasn't a council member. He was just, he happened to be there. And the king says, hey, I need someone to figure out what this dream means. And the wine bears like, oh, I remember someone who can help us. He's the same person who helped me seven years ago. And he says, please let me go to prison and speak to this person. He can provide the meaning of the dream. So he rushes back to prison and he comes back and he goes ahead and he says, Yusuf, ay you has Siddiq. Hey, Yusuf, hey, how you been? <laughs> hey, truthful, good friend of mine. Right, um, I just need you again. The beauty of Yusuf Salam's entire description, or his entire story, when it comes to his character, is he was not a man that was, that he wasn't petty. He wasn't a petty person. Like, he wasn't just like nice, he was not petty. Like, if this moment came to me, or, for, or to you, like, what do you mean nice guy? I've been rotting here for seven years. Because you simply forgot to mention my name. How dare you come back with such expectations of me? If you want me to help you this time, first get me out, then what? I'll tell you what the dream means. Like fulfill your side of the obligation. Then I'll do my part. But we said earlier, he was a muhsin. And a muhsin does not do what he is required to do. He does what he is not expected to do. So he doesn't act as if you've done all this to me and now you're coming back. Rather, he goes ahead and he explains what the dream means. And this time he doesn't even think about asking him because now he knows that Allah is the source of support for him anyways. So that person asks for the dream. By the way, if people only call us when they need us, I know we always think of it to be a bad thing, like you only call me when you need me. That's, that's so what? At least they call us when they need us. What if they didn't call us even when they needed us? I know parents who would have loved for the kids to call them when they need them. But they don't call their parents. This like idea of being self-righteous that, oh, you only call me when you need, but I, o I also only call that person when I need them. It's perfectly fine. It's not a moment to gloat. Now, I'm not saying we should only do that. But it's not such that it should, be, it should make the person feel ashamed. Sometimes when we help someone, we make them and we... 
when we're helping them, that person in their mind is saying, Oh Allah, please don't let me ask this person again. Because the way they're helping is making me feel the way that I feel. Well, the Prophet of Allah said, under the, under the tafsir of the ayah of يُخْرِدُ اللَّهَ قَرْضًا حَسَنًا is that when you give someone something, طِيبَ nafs, You do it in such a beautiful manner, the person actually feels honorable versus feeling dismissed. Whereas sometimes when you give someone something, the way that they feel is such that they never want to come back again. So he doesn't do that. He just says, so it's okay. I'm sure you had a reason. And he goes ahead and tells them what the dream means. The dream means that we will have seven years of a great economy. And then after seven years, we'll have an economy that will have no, it will not produce any crops for us. And all the animals will die. So we have to figure out how to survive in those seven years. What, and earlier I said a muhsin was a person who does more than what he is asked to do. What did Yusuf do in this, in this situation? He was asked what the dream meant. And he responded by saying what? He responded by saying the dream means this and here's the solution. What a beautiful person. Versus someone, if I go to someone that's like a very like an IT expert, I guess that's what they call it, right? Like a phone expert, say my phone's like laggy. Yeah, it's laggy because of this. Okay, what can I do? Uh, you have to do this now. Okay, how do I do it? Like, we will make the person beg for the solution. Like, uh, what next? Whereas a person of Ihsan, who Ihsan's preconditions that you love the person. You can't have Ihsan if you don't love the person. So the Prophet of Allah said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحبه you can't be a believer until you love for yourself or for your brother what you love for yourself. Because without love and mahabba, you can't start the discussion of ihsan. So when you love someone, you can project their questions before they even ask. Like a mother and a father, the child does not need to ask them everything. They simply need to what? Just present the situation. And the parents know what to do. That's called love. That's what he did. Like, not like, oh, my car's messed up, what do I do? Uh, well, like, your, your, your car's messed up. You, you know, actually, what's wrong is your, your, your rotors are messed up. Okay. You're a mechanic. Yeah, yeah, I am. Okay. How do I fix them? Go to AutoZone. Okay. Then what? You know what? Then you can come to my shop on Tuesday. That's like four steps. You could, we could have simply said, hey, your rotors are messed up. I have extra rotors in my shop. Not that you have to give it for free. That's not the point. The point is to just accelerate the process of not making the person have to suffer and ask multiple questions. Because that's what creates a sense of, uh, of dismissiveness for that person. Like, am I not that worthy that you're making me like beg you for the solution? That's not what Yusuf Aisadam did. So he goes ahead and he provides a solution. When he provides a solution, here's the beauty of Ihsan. The beauty of Ihsan I mentioned earlier is that Allah's nature is cyclical. That the beauty of Ihsan is that when we do Ihsan for someone, we can't ask for anything in return ourselves, but Allah always reciprocates. Allah is the greatest muhsin. There is no one who is a muhsin that can be better than Allah. So when you serve Allah's creation, Allah serves us. So, you know, for example, I recall um, one day finally after people, people always ask us, you know, how did your parents raise you? I'm like, I don't know, you have to ask them. <laughs> like, we're struggling ourselves. But so one day we asked our mother, like, you know, Amiji, what did you do different that you think was of some support? She said that, you know, I'm not, you know, of course, hopefully you know, the idea of humility, like, I don't know anything different. Like, you know, but what, what do you think? So we can at least, what, implement it as parents, because now we are, what, parents. She said, you know, two things that I can allude to. One, in Urdu, she said, you know, kisi neg bandi ki dua lagi. Like, someone who is extremely pious, their dua worked. Meaning, that someone made dua for you. Number two, we would always serve people that would come to our community. We would always what? Serve other people. Like we want that our children grow in a certain way, but we don't want to serve anyone else. We want our, we want our lifestyle to be like this, but without helping anyone else's lifestyle. Like if my son screams in the masjid, it's a masjid, why are you screaming at him? But if someone else's son screams in the masjid, isn't there babysitting here? Like... That's called not having justice. Because justice doesn't look at the person, looks at the principle. The idea of doing things for people always returns to us in a manner that we would not expect. 
Allah loves his slaves more than a mother loves her children. If you were to serve someone's children, the mother will love you. Similarly, if you were to serve Allah's creation, Allah will also love us. Like we, in that boarding school, sometimes when parents meet us, they're like, they're, they love us, they're so kind to us. I'm like, I've never met you before. And the idea is, no, you've served my son. So I love you for that. So imagine if someone serves Allah's creation, how much Allah will love us for that. That's called Ihsan. Ihsan always comes back around. So he never asked to be taken out of prison, but since he's a muhsin, the king said, bring him to me. Meaning, take this guy out of prison, he can't be, like he has to be someone of, of, of great righteousness if he knew what the dream meant. And when they come to him, the, the youngster who saw the dream the first time rushes back into prison and says, oh Yusuf, the king's calling you. He's saying, come out, you're free. He's giving you clemency. Like imagine being in prison for all these years and being given clemency. Like we would rush out of prison. He says, I, I am not going anywhere. Like the same guy who was asking seven years ago was saying, no, hey, you know what? I'm good. Go back to your king and tell him that I'm not leaving until my name is cleared. I don't want a handout because my reputation matters. I'm a prophet. That's the difference. Now people will say that this man is calling people towards Allah, but he was only freed because of his skill set. Now someone's going to say, that's why our da'wah is directly affected by our character. The Prophet ﷺ was the greatest da'i because he had the highest character. إِنَّكَ لَا عَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Our presence of character is what gives us the right to give da'wah. So I'm not going to come out because if I, have an, if I have a stain attached to my name, and of course Allah is ghafoor and Allah is rahim and we're all weak, but being a prophet is a different level. I can't have a stain attached to my name. Tell them that I'm not leaving until my name is cleared. The Prophet of Allah, the second time he said, Rahim Allah Yusuf. May Allah's love be upon Yusuf. He says, Lo kuntu fi makani, la If I was in his if I was in his spot, I would have rushed to the door. And again, he's just saying this to honor Yusuf salam, that he had such dignity. At that moment where he was in need, he still what? Didn't take it. Now I want my name to be cleared. So the king calls the same people to his palace, and all of them claim that no, Yusuf alayhi salam, ma hasha lillah. This man did not commit any, ma alimna alayhi min su. He never committed any crime. It was always us. And then Zulaikha also cleared Yusuf alayhi salam's name, and then Yusuf alayhi salam said, now I'm coming out. I'm not coming out because of you. I'm coming out because I never did anything wrong anyways. My name must be cleared. So the first high is Yusuf alayhi salam leaving prison. The second high is when the king brought him out of prison, he said, amin," Which means that you have a noble position in my palace. Like, I want you to work for me. I want you to work for me because of how A, you have high level integrity, and B, you're extremely talented because you knew what the dream meant, and you had the solution. Now, this is the beauty of Qadr. If he had not been a muhsin, the king would not have made him a treasure, right? If he had not been a muhsin, the king had not, would not have made him a treasure. He only became a treasure because he, he actually gave the solution. We'll say, well, I'll give you the solution after I get the job. And what Dean is saying, give the solution, then you get the job. Like, why is it so that sometimes youngsters have to almost like beg for recommendations to get, play, to get you know, letters or advice from people who've already made it somewhere. Why is it so difficult? Your risk is your risk. Ain't nobody gonna take it. If someone takes my job, that means it wasn't meant for me anyways. Well, why do I have to hold back in my advice to a youngster, and I'm talking to youngsters specifically, that if I've gotten a position where I've made it somewhere, and someone younger than me is on that same journey, being stingy with advice is worse than being stingy with wealth. At least wealth you're giving and it leaves. My advice is like, so what? And oh, you, have to, you, have to earn your, you have to earn your stripes, said a person who was always stingy. Like, what do you mean earn your stripes? Someone gave you advice once upon a time. And I'm not saying give people handouts. But the idea of ihsan is to be able to give, and it will always come back to empower each other, to enable one another as iman does. The demand of iman is that we always enable one another. We don't hold back. He gave the advice, then he became the treasure. 
Not that let me first become the treasure, then I'll tell you the solution. That's being incentivized. How often? We live in a time where we even calculate our handshakes. We even calculate how we shake people's hands. That this person can benefit me, let me shake their hands like this. This person uh, doesn't look like it. Let me just what? Give him one of those what? Like, Assalamu Alaikum. On Eid, just a half hug, not even the what? The three is too much, but at least a full one. <laughs> right, and again, there's layers of relationships. We're not trying to compare, it's not a socialist environment. <laughs> not everyone's the what? The same, but everyone still demands the bare minimum rights. Bare minimum rights. Why is it so that if I take a picture with someone that brings me value, I'll post it. If I take a picture with someone who doesn't bring me value, I'm not posting that. Because every relationship is cultivated only if it brings me benefit. If I'm not a beneficiary of it, I don't want to invest in it. Whereas the Prophet of Allah invested in relationships where the person was the beneficiary. And he understood that if someone else in my community is a beneficiary, it also benefits me. Because the believers are like one body. It's an ecosystem. Growth somewhere else means growth for my children. If someone else's son makes it, I shouldn't have spite. That means my son will also make it. My daughter will also make it. That's what Iman teaches us. That the idea of when was the last time, and I'm asking myself, that I invested in cultivating a relationship where I wasn't a beneficiary. Like there was nothing in it for me. Very difficult to find those moments because the way that we're taught to live in America. And the first time I thought about it was when, I was in, when we were in Jordan. Like, this is the first time I felt like I was doing something where I had no benefit in, except for Akhirah. And it was the most fulfilling feeling. Because it was so pure. Supporting people makes you feel good when it's pure. There is, this is why the word relief, Ibn Hajj rahimullah, rather Imam Ghazali rahimullah defines relief. You know relief work? He says, the mindset that the Prophet taught Sahabas of relief was that you must know that the greatest beneficiary of your support is you and yourself. Not anyone else. The moment we're able to internalize that idea of huquq, then being nice to people isn't dependent upon them being nice to me. Right? It's going to happen anyways. Right? So this is where Allah gives back though. Allah will always give back. We spend money, Allah gives back what? More money. It's called ihsan. So the king says, I want to hire you. And Yusuf says, well, if you want to hire me, then why don't you just make me the treasurer? It's so beautiful that Yusuf would not have the knowledge and the know-how of how to be the treasurer if he wasn't a slave. You understand? Because the only reason why he knew how to be a treasurer was because he was raised in the house of the treasurer. So he saw everything for all these years. He watched his, his, his master be the treasurer for all these years. He was in his gathering for all these years. And now since he was a slave for all those years, and the position opened up, he was the right person for the job. This is why Ali anhu says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qadr is so beautiful that he had to make Yusuf, not he had to, but Yusuf became a slave simply to become the treasurer. This is the, the journey of Yusuf alayhi salam. He first, if he hadn't become a slave, he would not become a treasure. If he had not become the treasure, he would never have found his parents. Right? He would never have found his brothers or Yaqub. So this entire journey is teaching the Prophet ﷺ that what you're going through right now will bring you to a point where you will understand all of this. You will understand why you had to leave Mecca when you come back for Fath Mecca. Then it will all make sense to you, like it will for all of us as well. If not in this world, it's perfectly fine. It can be for the Akhirah. Because this notion that إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ yusra means that every difficulty comes with an ease is for dunya is actually incorrect. Inam al usri yusra, usr, Imam Ghazali says, actually means dunya. And yusr means what? Akhirah. That's it. Because sometimes people actually live in that difficulty till, they're, till they leave the world. That that's their norm. Like you see these kids or these families living in these refugee camps, that is their default. That is their life. And there is no light at the end of the tunnel for them. But their yusr is not in them. Their yusr is where? In akhirah. Right? So the Prophet is being taught through this story about qadr being the way it is. So now, after becoming the treasurer, وَجَاءِ إِخْوَةُ يُوسُفُ 
the brothers of Yusuf come. The brothers of Yusuf come four times. How many times? Four times. And I'm going to quickly go through the first three. Inshallah, spend some more time on the, on the last one. The brothers of Yusuf come, and when they enter upon Yusuf alayhi salam, he recognizes all of them, but they obviously cannot recognize him because now obviously the time has passed where he was a kid, now he's a adult. B, they couldn't tell who he was simply because there was no way a child in the well could become the treasurer. Like the position was, was unfathomable that you could become the treasurer. And they ask for their stipend, and he gives them their money, for each brother, he gives them the amount that they were allocated. And then they say that we have another brother at home. So we're, there's actually 11 of us. 10 of them came. We have an 11, 11th one at home. Can you give us his stipend too? Like in America, when COVID hit, you can only claim a stipend for those who, are, who, are, who, are, who can be claimed. You have to claim their responsibility. So there's an 11th one who's not here, but give us his money. Yusuf salam says, well, well, if you don't have him, I can't. If, you, if he's not here, I can't give you his money. He's an adult. He should be here to prove that he's what? Alive. I can't just give you his, his goods without him being here. So bring me your brother and then I'll give him to you. He said, no, we can't bring him. So why not? And they told the truth. Like, because we messed up, you know, once upon a time we did this. And that's why our father will not trust us with our younger brother. He said, well, if you can't bring your brother, I can't give you his, his share. It's as simple as that. This is, and of course... He was, he was doing so because he wanted to see his brother. This was his in. Like imagine being Yusuf salam and your brother's coming back to you who committed that crime against you. And now they're coming to beg you of, can you support us? Like give us, not like luxury support. This is basic support. Food, necessity. This is like survival. And if we were Yusuf, we would take them for a ride, right? He wasn't petty. He gave them everything. He simply said, I need your brother though, because he wanted his brother. So they go back home, and then when they get back home, they say, oh father, you know, this king was very nice to us. He gave us full shares, and on top of that, he put his money back in the bag. So the brothers that brought their money, he put the money back in their bags. Ibn Kathir rahimullah makes it clear, he did not put their money back in the bag. He put his money back. There's a difference. Their money was the state's money. His money was his money. It's very easy to be generous with someone else's wealth. Like how youngsters sometimes are generous with their parents' money, right? It's very difficult to be generous with your own money. He put his money back. It's not like the money of the government isn't his. It's the government's money. It's amana. So he gave his money. And then, oh Father, look at this king, he's such a kind person. He returned our wealth to us and he also gave us such large shares. We never, we were unable to get Benjamin's share because he didn't come with us. Please send him with us. And as they sought permission from the father, finally Yaqub said, لَنْ أَرْسِلْهُ مَعَكُمْ حَتَّى تُؤْتُونِي مَوْتِقَ مِنَ اللَّهِ I will not send him with you unless you make a promise with Allah that you will not return without him regardless of what happened. And unless you are killed. Unless you're killed. Other than that, you better come back with him. I'm not going to trust you without taking an oath with Allah. Meaning, all of you have to take a halaf. Wallahi, this will not happen. They all took an oath. They'd return the second time with their brother, Bin Yamin. And as they're going, just quickly, the father gave them advice. All my children, لا تدخلوا من بابن Wahid, don't enter from one door, enter from different doors because entering from one door may cause a lot of attention that may be a source of ayn or hasad because there were 11 brothers. It's better if you enter from separate doors. Now, this is interesting. The commentators say that though Yaqub's heart was still broken from the evil of what these brothers did, it did not become an excuse for him not to be a father. He continued to still be a father. He did not use that against his children as ammunition for the rest of their lives. But like sometimes what we would do, like you remember what you did when you were like that? Like, no. If, if it's done, then now fulfill my responsibility. Like he didn't have to tell his children that I want you to avoid Ain, But he did so because he still is their father. There's no condition that has to be met by the children for me to be the father. I'm the father regardless. I'm the mother regardless of what they do to me. 
Right? So, and he, and he fulfilled that right. The second time they come, they come with Binyamin. The second time when they come, they come with their brother, and Allah SWT highlights, It was as if, it's like the story wasn't like they came in and he grabbed Binyamin. But Allah highlights this part because that's how it was for Yusuf. It was like everything else was, was invisible, and he ignored everyone else, and he grabbed his brother and said, Come here. Awa means to bring into your protection of love. To bring into your comfort. That's what awa means. So what happens in tafsir is at nighttime, they would have rooms that each people, like two pairs of pe two people would stay in. Two brothers for each room. And since they all had a partner, the 11th was who? Because you couldn't just tell them, make him Binyamin. And Binyamin also doesn't recognize him. So after putting them all in their own quarters and rooms, he says, Binyamin, you stay here because you're the what? 11th and 12th. And he enters a room with him and awa. And he simply embraces him. Ibn Qadir rahimahullah narrates a story that Abdullah ibn Abbas says, no, we're not allowed to be, we're not allowed to ask Allah to raise us in a time that we were not raised in. Because Allah raised us in this time because this is the time that is right for us. But if I was allowed to, I would have asked Allah to raise me when Yusuf was reunited with Binyamin. I would have loved to see the, the, the pure emotions of after 40 years, some say 60 years of these brothers meeting each other. What was that like? And the stories it mentions that, you know when you meet someone after a long time that you love, you hug them and then what happens? You let them go, then what happens? You hug them again. <laughs> you hug them again. They continue doing this from nighttime till sunrise. Just meeting each other. And when he first hugged his brother and he's crying, the brother's like, I mean, who are you anyways? <laughs> and he said, Qala inni ana akhuk. Someone who loves you, like, they, if they know who you are, that's enough. Like, I remember my, us brothers, we went for um, hajj with our parents when we were like kids. Like, I mean, like, I'm still, I think 2000, 2001, and I was probably like five years old. I'm not, actually, I'm not giving more my age. But I was probably around that age. And I remember someone coming and knocking on the door. This man, my brothers, us, us brothers are there. And this man, I, I can, I'm number four. So I'm very young. And this man had a big white beard. And he walks in. And he sees us. And he grabs me and just starts kissing me. And he's just crying. I'm like, yo, this, is everything okay? Like, I'm in Medina, but should I? Stranger danger? <laughs> What's going on here? And out of nowhere, my mother, who normally doesn't like, oh, she's, she doesn't openly meet men unless there's a need, she rushes out, and this man just hugs her. And I'm like, whoa! <laughs> like, what's happening? What's going on? And then she starts saying, Baya. And she's, Bajan. She is, he, like, he's my eldest mamu. Right? She's my, my mother's eldest brother, who we haven't, at that point, we had not seen our entire life. Because he lived in Saudi, we lived in America. So when we saw him after all these years, man was so overwhelmed with joy that when he's hugging us, he's just crying. He can't even say who he is. We're like, who are you? And that is like love that is limited. Imagine this love. Like, they won't, who are you? That's all I can say. I'm your what? I'm your brother. Don't grieve about what they did to me. It's all good. Right? The, beauty, like the, the challenge though, the challenge, and, and this is a harsh reality. The challenge is that yes, usr comes with yusr. Difficulty comes with ease. But the promise of Allah was not that the yusr will last as long as the usr. Right? Sometimes the difficulty is 60 years. In the point of happiness is only two years. Sometimes someone doesn't have a child for so many years. Finally, when they have a child, Allah takes the father's life or the mother's life. It doesn't have to be equal in dunya because for us, being equal means that it's ended. But it hasn't ended. For us, there's a next life to look forward to. Can you imagine? This is Ibn Abbas makes a comment. He says, can you imagine if this is the level of joy and excitement that is felt 
when two beloveds meet each other in dunya, what their enjoyment will be like when they meet each other in the akhirah? Like, what that experience will look like when a mother who lost her child can now finally hug him again, or her. These mothers and parents in Gaza who have lost their children, can you imagine how Allah will honor them on the Day of Judgment? How Allah will put them on a pedestal for everyone to see this is what love is. This is what Iman does for us. Like, I remember when my brother Rahimullah was, was being buried and there was a brother that was there. For the, I mean, there was many people in Janazah, but one of the youngsters that was next to us in the Janazah, if you were to look at him, you would not see a, a religious person. He, was, he had a certain hairstyle, he was dressed in a certain way. But somehow, my brother used to play basketball with him. So he was there. And he was tall, and he's standing there, and he has his hand over us. He looks, he looks at us, brother, he says, he wipes his tears, he says, well, brothers, Jannah has finally become personal. In that moment, you realize, that's a powerful statement. If you can make something personal for yourself, it's very hard to fail. And the Sahabas made Jannah personal for themselves because the Prophet was there. Yeah, so if the Prophet is there, I have to get there. For then that's all that matters. So can you imagine when Bilal عنه, is passing away and everyone is saying around him, what a sad day. And he says, no, what a day of happiness. Tomorrow I'm meeting the Prophet of Allah. There was a companion who came. The Prophet one day and he was crying. The Prophet says, what are you crying for? He says, Rasulullah, I was sitting, his name was Thawban I was sitting with my family and as I was sitting enjoying, just chilling with my family, I remembered Jannah. And I remembered that I will die and you will die. And when you will die, you will enter into a Jannah far greater than mine. Because you're the Prophet of Allah and I will go into a lower level of Jannah. Then you know, so it came to me that if you're at a higher level in Jannah, I won't be able to see you. Like what is Jannah if I can't experience your qurb in closeness? And the Prophet Allah remained silent. And Allah revealed, That you will be with those whom you actually love. Anas ibn Malik says that us companions never experienced happiness like this before other than becoming Muslim. This was the happiest day of our life. That we knew that the condition of ascending in Jannah was not our deeds. It was our love for the Prophet of Allah. That was enough for us. So it's personal. This is in dunya. Imagine what it will look like in the akhirah. So he goes ahead and the brother says to him, Binyamin says, don't send me back. And it was harder for Binyamin actually. It was harder for him because for Yusuf, he knew he was alive. But Binyamin, he thought his brother was, his brother was dead. And he's living in this reality that his brother has already passed away. He's not a prophet. He doesn't have that intuition that Yaqub has, alayhi salam. And now he's been told that you're alive. So he says, don't send me back. Let me stay with you. And the brother says, okay, let me, we'll plan something. Can you blame him for this? Well, he plants the cup inside of his bag. And the next day he says, hey guys, you guys stole something from me. And one of you guys stole it. He said, well, we haven't stolen nothing. We're not here to cause any mischief. We're here just to take whatever we came for and leave. You know, just like how Ihsan comes around, so does what? So does the opposite of it. When you break someone's heart and when you hurt someone, it can also come around. It can also come around. It's very interesting. Imam Ghazali has this entire discussion about, you know when you harm someone, the condition is that first you have to ask them for forgiveness, then you have to ask Allah, right? First you have to ask the person, can you forgive me? The Prophet says in a hadith, that if you harm someone, first ask them for forgiveness. Then you have to ask who? Allah. We always think of it to be a one-way street. That if I ask the person, he forgives me, Allah has already what? Forgiven me. As long as the person has what? Forgiven me. No, but Allah still has to what? Forgive us. Sometimes, and this happens a lot, sometimes a son will forgive you, but the mother will not forgive you. Right? If you harm someone's child, the, ch the youngster, like I'll forgive the person, but my mother's like, no, I'm not forgiving him. Because what you did was you hurt, you hurt her. So sometimes, again, Allah loves us more than our mothers love us. 
But sometimes when you harm a believer, this is, the, this is the fear of harming someone. That when you break someone's heart and you harm them, and I harm them, the person may forgive us, but Allah says, ah, I'm not ready yet. And they, that person experiences the pain of that in dunya, not in akhirah. So sometimes we are reciprocating the harm that we cause someone else. And it's also cyclical both ways. Not just one. So it's not enough to kind of like say, ah, the guy forgave me. No. But did Allah forgive us? I know the, 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 our mother, our dear mother Aisha عنها, was accused of the unspeakable act of, of, what she, of what they said that she committed, of zina. And the munafiqun started saying things about her. The famous story of her being accused of this act. When she was accused of this act by the munafiqun, some companions also ended up getting caught in the propaganda. Right? And one of them, his name was Hassan ibn Thabit. Great companion. Great companion. The Prophet loved him. He became blind at the end of his life. He said, I have become blind because of what I said about my mother. He said, she forgave you. He said, yeah, she forgave me, but I still broke her heart. This is the outcome of that. Umar anhu says that I can tell you every one of those munafiqs that said something about Aisha and how they passed away. It was a humiliating death. It was a humiliating death because it caused harm. The Prophet's heart was broken by Abu Lahab. Abu Jahl too. Abu Lahab did something, something, Abu Lahab did something that was personal. Abu Jahl, Umayyah ibn Khalf, these people kept it to a religion. What did Abu Lahab do? He made his children divorce the daughters of the Prophet I mean, that's heavy. And he made them kick them out of their homes. Right? And he disgraced them. That my sons will not be married to the daughters of the Prophet Allah disgraced him. Allah doesn't mention Abu Jahl in the Quran. He doesn't mention Umayyah ibn Khalf in the Quran. But this now is reciprocal. If you harm him directly, I will also harm you directly. This is why the Prophet says in Hadith al-Qudsi, that Allah says, Man li waliyan faqad bil harb. Whosoever harms my friend, I wage war upon that person. It's cyclical both ways. The reason why I just said that is because the brothers of Yusuf this time around did not commit a crime. They made no mistake. But they were treated the same way as if they made a mistake. Because now they're experiencing the effect of that first mistake. They have to go back to the father this time again and tell the father. And of course the cup was found in Binyamin's bag and they had to go back. Their brother said, we're not going to go back. You know, there's no way that we're going to go back. Our father will not be okay with it. And Yusuf salam said, well, it's okay. Tell your father to ask the caravan that you're with. Meaning you have proof that he stole this time. So ask him. While this all happened, by the way, you know, spite is something which is really like, it's hard to remove. Malice, spite, jealousy. So after all of this, one of the brothers said, in yasraq, Imagine, like, imagine if we were Yusuf and these people are like begging you for food and then they say something like this. Well, if Binyamin stole, makes sense. His brother used to also steal. And Yusuf. Like, can you imagine the level of audacity? No, I wouldn't have said it if I knew it was you. Well, of course. But why'd you say it anyways? You know how we say something. I, I, if you were there, I wouldn't have said it. Like, well, that doesn't make you more noble. It makes it worse. فَأَسَرَّهَا يُوسُفُ فِي نَفْسِهِ Like, in other words, he had to, he had to clench his teeth. Mm. Mm. Like, I want to say something, but I won't say it. وَلَمْ يُبْدِيهَا لَهُمْ That shows, again, a level of power and control over your emotions. So they go back to the father, and when they get back to the father, the father comes and says, they come back and they say, this is what happened. And the father responds the same way. This is, this is something that you have crafted in your mind. Look, it doesn't matter what happened in the back end. Losing a son will always have the same effect. Like, I don't care if you sent him to a wolf or if you got rid of him. It's the same thing. He's not with me anymore. So the response remains, فَصَبْرٌ Jamil. It doesn't change. Like his response for Binyamin was not anything less. The only thing that he added was, Asallahu an yatiani bihim jamia. Soon Allah will bring me both of them back together. And as he's saying this, 
and he's crying, anhum. He turns away from them, and he simply voices under his breath, Ya asafa ala Yusuf. How I miss my Yusuf. How I miss Yusuf. الحسن. And Allah says that he lost his eyesight from how much he cried. Like, the Prophet being the greatest of all prophets, we see that he lost six of his seven children. And the man rose to every occasion. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Burying his last son Ibrahim was the greatest cause of pain that he had. Because now he was 61 years old. It's different when you, when they're young. I remember when our, when our, our mother, um, were five, so my youngest brother, we, we all went to the boarding school at the same time. At, at one point, because of course the age differences are such that, not at the same time, but at one point we were all there together. And when my youngest one was going, of course the youngest brother, you know, that's, they get the most spoiled. So to let them go is always the hardest. So my mother, Sheikh Abdullah says the story, my oldest brother, that I saw her ironing. Our, she, what she would do is she would open up five bags, and Allah bless her, and she, would, she spoiled us where she would iron every pair of our clothes and she would put it inside the bag. And we would have a lot of clothes because we would enjoy wearing this. So you had to iron every single one. It's not a shirt. Shirts are easy. This is like a kameez, right? She ironed them, put them in the bag, iron them, put them in the bag. So she was ironing, she was ironing clothes and it seems like there's moisture, like as, as if there's steam. And my brother says, I look closer and I see my mother crying. And my mother never, like, she won't cry in front of us because that can only, it makes it harder for us. We would look for it, just cry, please, please. <laughs> you know? So we can also uh, just cry a little bit more. And um, so she's crying. And our brother says, I mean, what are you crying for? She says, you know, when I sent you, she just says, says to Sheikh Abdullah, when I sent you, you were, the, you, were, you were the one gone, but I still had what? The others at home. So it was easy. And I sent the second one that I had what? Three. Then me and our brother went together. So I sent Abdul Aziz and Abdul Wahab, but I still had who? The youngest one, right? When Sheikh Abdullah went to boarding school, my eldest brother went to boarding school the month after my youngest brother was born. There was a 10-year gap, right? And now he's the only one that I have, and now I have to what? Send him, and now I'm old. When you went, I was young and strong. So now I'm old, it's harder for me. I need him. And that's where the reward is also more. Al-ajru ma'aqadrin nasab. Right? Al-ajru ma'aqadrin nasab. The reward spectrum of Allah is based upon the difficulty of the act that we fulfilled for Him. There's no way praying salat for us is the same reward as for those who prayed in Ghazza. It's the same salat, different reward. Because it's far more difficult for them to pray it. Similarly, for us, announcing our religion in America is not the same as announcing it in Pakistan. Because there's more challenges here. So there's more reward. So when you're old and you lose something, it's very hard. The Prophet, the Prophet of Allah, some of these scholars of Sirah say that the heartache that the Prophet passed away from was the death of Ibrahim. Because he was old and it was hard for him to deal with it, which is, the nat which is natural. But Yaqub loses one and his eyesight goes away. Right? Alayhi salam. And he turns away and he says this. And the brothers, you know, till this point, they were not triggered. Because they, they never... He never said anything that exposed him. But the moment he said Yusuf's name, he was like, Oh, Allah tafta utadkuru Yusuf. Wallahi, you always be talking about Yusuf. Why did they get so triggered? Because in Yusuf's situation, they committed a crime. And mentioning it makes him feel uncomfortable. So like, why are you always talking about Yusuf for? We didn't lose Yusuf, we lost who? Bin Yameen. You're going to keep talking about him until you become old and sick and until you die. Stop talking about him. And by the way, it's normal. It wasn't, it wasn't irrational. or It wasn't against the norm to mention Yusuf in that situation because basic psychology tells you about triggers. And when he lost Ben Yamin, he also remembered Yusuf. Simple as that. He looks at them and he says, إِنَّمَا أَشْكُوا بَثِّي this is where he says it. That I wasn't complaining to you anyways. I was complaining to Allah. Why are you getting all riled up for? My conversation isn't with you. You are feeble, weak beings. My conversation is with who? Allah. I complain to Allah. 
like complaining about my sadness to Allah, it's perfectly permissible, if not encouraged. If I can't speak to Allah about my broken heart, then who can I speak to? The darkness of the night is a place that the lovers find, find enjoyment in speaking to Allah. And that time of the night, even a mute person's voice is heard. So Allah doesn't need us to speak. Allah needs for the heart to express itself. Doesn't mean like Musa salam was the least eloquent prophet. He was the least eloquent prophet. He had a stutter. But he was the only prophet given the title of Kalimullah. Our physical abilities don't dictate how much we can take from Allah. It's the heart that matters in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when he says this, he's, he looks back at his sons and he says, Hey, idhabu fatahassasu min Yusuf hu akhi. Go find Yusuf and his brother. Again, the father's intuition was, something has happened. Go find Yusuf and his brother. لا تيأسوا من روح الله Don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Allah's mercy will never give up on you. Don't give up on the mercy of Allah. It's okay. Meaning even if you committed a crime, it's okay. Allah will forgive you for it. So they go back. This is the third time they go back, right? They come back the third time. And this time they enter upon Yusuf alayhi salam. And they actually bring a letter. Imam Qurtub rahimullah narrates that they bring a letter from the father. The father is writing his like plea deal. Like a letter of plea. And he says, he writes it to the king. He says, O treasure, ya ayyuhal aziz, qad ishtuhira ilmuka wa juduka wa karumuk. Like your, your knowledge, your grace, your kindness and compassion has touched all the lands. Everyone knows of who you are. You're very famous because you're kind. O king, my eyebrows have covered my eyes. My hands shake when I hold things. In kasar al dahri my back is broken. And the only support that I had was my son bin Yamin. And he would hold my hand when I would shake. Beautiful letter written. He would carry, he would hold my back when I would be unable to walk. And you took him from me. Can you please return my son to me? Now, regardless of who the, where the son is in his life or daughter is, no child ever wants to experience the parents going through pain. That is, is uncharted territory for a child. No matter how old the child is, how old we are. Like seeing the mother or father go through pain is what brings pain to us. So as he's reading it, he's just crying. And this is when the brothers look at him and say, Ma hadihi al-buka, ya aziz. They don't know who he is. And this is, this is where he exposes himself. Like, what, is, what are you crying for? Now he's, the first time, like, you know, if you can't see your loved one, but you hear a phone call, it also creates love and emotions. Text message, right? Someone that has already passed away, you have text messages from them. It also increases love. Like this is a mess, this is the first time he has interacted with his father in 60 years. 40 to 60 years. Ibn Abbas says, if this is the love Yaqub had for Yusuf, can you imagine the love Yusuf had for Yaqub? Like, it was unique. And as he's crying and hearing what his father in such a dire state where he saw his father to be so healthy and strong, now he's physically ill, it broke him. And as he's crying, they ask, then he says, Hey, هَلْ عَلِمْتُمْ مَا فَعَلْتُمْ بِيُوسُفَ وَأَخِيهِ إِذَنْ تُمْ جَاهِلُونَ do you all recall what you did to Yusuf and his brother? And the beauty of this man's entire story is that he never made the story about himself. He never made, he never tried to capitalize on his situation as you would do. He says, do you remember what you did to Yusuf and his brother? I don't want you to think it's just about me. You also harmed bin Yamin. And the reality of life is that when you harm one person, you also harm many people with them. So the sin of harming someone, this is why actually in our fiqh we are taught that if you harm someone and it affects others around them, you have to ask them for an apology too. Like you have to ask the parents for an apology. And this is why we're also taught 
that if someone that we did wrong to has passed away, we should ask their loved ones for an apology. Because they were also affected by it. Like, it's not, we don't live in silos, right? Everything affects everyone. So he says, do you know what you did to my brother as well? And then at this moment, they say, أَإِنَّكَ لَأَنْتَ Yusuf." A moment of shock. And the translation of this is, it means, there's no translation. أَإِنَّكَ لَأَنْتَ Yusuf means, are you really, no you're not. Are you really Yusuf? And he says, hey guys, I said it once. Ana Yusuf wa hada akhi. It's not about me. I'm Yusuf. But stop, stop making this about me. It's also my brother. Wa hada akhi. Like, the moment of triumph is normally where people start breaking relationships. When there's no money around, everyone is together. When money comes, there's what? Difficulties. When there is no large homes, everyone's okay. But now everyone has a large home, now it's challenging. We always want to make the moment of triumph about ourselves. Whereas he is sitting there in that moment, and like the Prophet of Allah Wasallam, that when he entered into Fatih Mecca, Ali says that he's conquering Mecca, and his head is so low on his camel, that it's hitting the animal. Like rather than doing this, he's doing what? This. And he's saying, Alhamdulillah alladhi sadaqa wa'dah wa nasara abda. Like the level of humility a person needs to have at a moment of triumph. To say these words is perhaps uncomparable to anything we've heard of. Like at the point of revenge where you were pelted with stones and and you are persecuted like no one else. And you're walking back and you're saying, no, no. All praise is due to Allah who fulfilled His promise. He supported His slave. So in this moment, you know, Anna Yusuf wa hada akhi. Again, this also talks about how much he loved bin Yamin. Right? And I always say this at this part of the story, that the most ignored relationships are siblings. When you're young, it's your parents. When you get married, it's your spouse and your children. And the one relationship which often gets ignored is siblings. Because you were just given them. <laughs> eh, whatever. And the, the, the reality is, neither of you and I are actually responsible for each other. Right? At the end of the day, everyone's an adult. At a certain point, yeah. The elder siblings play the role of a mother and a father too. But to a certain point, it's always, it's, you're not responsible for the other party. So we ignore them. But there's nothing like the relationship of siblings either. In fact, one of the greatest relationships in the Qur'an is of Harun and Musa. Siblings. Yusuf and bin Yamin. Siblings. Right? So it's important that even if you have siblings that are older, to stay in touch with them. Because that is a relationship that Allah gave us. It's a gift that Allah gave us. If we ignore the gift, it's problematic. Like I know youngsters who would have wished to have a sibling. Like they would have wished to have a brother or sister. But they were single children. And I know those who have brothers who say, I wish I never had a brother or a sister. Right? It's a blessing. And then he says, Qad manna What an honorable person. This is Allah's favor upon us. I mean, again, if it was me, are you Yusuf? I mean, yeah. <laughs> like, look at me. <laughs> brother, take a picture. <laughs> just, just don't forget don't forget this moment. How'd you get here? Yeah, I'll tell you later. We use the slightest victories as moments of jeering against people. Slightest victory. Like, it's not even a victory. Like, brother, why are you like all excited about buying a new car and I don't have a new car? It's like, who cares? I hope he doesn't know where I got the car from. Like, why? I hope he doesn't get my deal. Right? He's Allahu alayhi. This is Allah's favor upon us. And then he actually highlights the quality which gave him Allah's favor. This is where Abdullah ibn Abbas, and I want you, this part everyone should remember. Abdullah ibn Abbas was asked, what is the summary of the story of Yusuf? He said two qualities. Whoever has taqwa and patience. Taqwa and patience, all, both of these qualities come from the same root, which is resistance. And to be able to hold back. Taqwa means you can hold back your temptations. 
Sabr means you can hold back from your emotions. But they both come from the same root, which is self-control. And he says this, and the brothers then say, Wallahi, Allah has given you preference over us. Allah has given you virtue over us. Again, if it was us, we would say what? I mean, like, read the room, of course. You know what he says? There is no blame upon you. Imam Ghazali rahimullah says the height of someone, the height of you and I forgiving someone is that we can make dua for them behind their back. That means that you have truly what? Forgiven someone. That you can actually make, because you only make dua for people who you actually love. This is the peak of the sign of you actually forgiving them. The fact that he said to them, there's no blame upon you. Then he says, يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ May Allah forgive you guys too. وَهُوَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ It's okay, he is the most merciful. Like he didn't say, there's no blame upon you, but I've heard Jahannam is pretty hot. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, he could have said that too. There's no blame upon you, but mm, Akhirah is looking bleak for you. You know? No, يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ I got you. I got you. Oh, Arhamu Rahimim, man, don't worry. Allah is the most forgiving. Allah is the most forgiving. Now, I must say that in tafsir, it does speak about the forgiveness that the brothers sought. But there needs to be an understanding that humility, being humbled, is not the same thing as being apologetic. Sometimes in life, we seek forgiveness because now we were humbled. That's not really an apology, though it is, but it's not a real apology. The brothers of Yusuf, they saw forgiveness because life humbled them. Life humbled them. And Allah forgave them. But the reality is true, true forgiveness is when you're asking someone when you are not in need of them. When you have no benefit of asking for forgiveness. Normally we don't ask someone for forgiveness until we need them again. By the way, I apologize for that. Okay, what's next? Can you help me with this again? So hence, the brothers now, they, like they were forgiven, and this is the third time the Prophet of Allah said, Rahimullah Yusuf. The first time was when he, when he what, asked for prison. Second time was when he was leaving prison. This is the third time. He said, Rahimullah Yusuf. May Allah, love and mercy be upon Yusuf. He taught us how to act at a point of victory. So when the Prophet of Allah, there's no coincidences here. This story was given to Yusuf, the Prophet when he was at his lowest point. And he's remembering this ayah at his highest point. That when he's entering into Mecca, and they're saying to him, O Prophet of Allah, you are the most virtuous. He says, لا تثريب عليكم اليوم. There's no blame upon you. يغفر الله لكم. Allah will forgive. So the entirety of Mecca is being told, it's okay. Because at that moment, vengeance is, is a call of action. But no, لا تثريب عليكم اليوم. Allah will forgive you. So he said to the people that I will say what the brothers of Yusuf, what Yusuf said to the brothers of, to his brothers. That's what he said. Right? And that's what Prophet also responded. Again, that's why the Quran was given for support so the Prophet could learn from it and all of us could also learn from it. The story ends, and I'm done over here, that Yusuf then gives a shirt to his brothers that he takes off and he says, hey, idhabu bi qamisi hadha. Anyone who knows Arabic knows, bi qamisi would have been enough. Take my shirt. He said, take this shirt of mine. Which means that it was a unique shirt. So some say it was a shirt that was given to him in the well. That it was, a, it was a shirt of Jannah. Take, take this shirt of mine. And place it upon my father's eye so it can bring his eye. Because in that letter he said, I lost my eyesight. So he can bring my father's eyesight back. And then, bring your whole family back. So the brothers are going back. And as the caravan is getting close, the father says, What? Inni la ajidu riha Yusuf. Which is so powerful. It's not Yusuf coming. It is what? Shirt. Just his shirt. Can you imagine if Yusuf came? Ali salam. Just a shirt. I smelled the fragrance of Yusuf. Like one could say this is wahi. The other could say this is fatherly instincts. The mother knows that you're on the door before you even knock. She ain't a prophet. <laughs> and my mother, before I even get to the door, she already knows we're there. Like, well, you have cameras? 
spying on us. <laughs> she said, I just knew you were coming at this time. Right? She said, I just felt you. Like, inni la ajidu riha Yusuf. The other way of understanding is, I just feel Yusuf coming to me. I sense him. Like, imagine the type of love that you must have to be able to experience the nearness of someone just by feeling the smell of their shirt. That type of love. You know, when someone passes away or when you lose someone, like even their qamis can bring you up relief. So as a he's not saying that I think Yusuf is alive. He's saying I smell his what? Shirt. And there's no coincidence, again in the Quran, that which made him lose his eyesight was a shirt. And that which brought his eyesight back was also a shirt. Yeah, there is the miracle that when they placed a shirt on his eyes, it came back. But there's also the rational aspect of it, that he lost his eyesight because of the loss of Yusuf. And he gained his eyesight because of the gift of Yusuf. So they come and when he says this, you know when you're down, you want to stay, you kind of want to like, you want, you want to, if there's a mistake or a crime committed, you want to just hide it more and more. So the people in that camp that knew about the crime, for example, some say that this was like the wives of those brothers or the other brothers that didn't go with them. Like it was the same family. They said, no, oh, old man, you're just, you're just old. And sometimes parents say certain things and children, they, 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 they say these types of things. Oh, you're just getting really old. You don't understand the culture. That's actually a very dismissive thing to say to anyone. Forget parents. That's, like a, that's a very disrespectful thing to say to even your friends. You know, something like, you don't understand this stuff. You, you, you just don't get it. Like imagine saying this to your parents. That like, you're just too old. You don't get it. And we say that all the time. That is, that is, that is completely uncalled for. That is definitely a crime in every book of, of, Allah's, of Allah's deeds. To make someone who is a superior feel dismissed. Sometimes parents don't feel comfortable in certain gatherings because the children don't feel comfortable with them. Like what type of a son or daughter am I if my parents don't feel comfortable in my presence? Sometimes our parents walk in our homes like egg with eggshells. I don't want to do anything harm with my son. That's not how we repay them. Regardless of our age, that's what they were doing. No, old man, you're just old now. You're, just, you're hallucinating. You're going crazy. You know how we say, no, I think they're just going a little old. You're just going crazy. No, they're not. He knew what was happening. He says, no, I know what's happening. That's a sign. Okay. When the giver of glad tidings came, he placed a shirt on his eyes. Ya'ti basira, his eyesight came back. Ibn Abbas says, Allah bless him. He has such beautiful commentaries on this, uh, this, this surah. He says, why was it important for his eyesight to come back? Like, because the joy of his life was the presence of Yusuf. Would it really be a joy if you know that he's there but you can't see him? Like Yusuf's greatest blessing was what? His beauty. By the way, I didn't mention this earlier. The, you know, we know, we, we've heard of the statement that in every difficulty there is what? Ease. But the statement also works the other way. In every blessing there is challenges. Every blessing there is what? Challenges. Yusuf salam's greatest blessing was his beauty. His greatest blessing was his? Was his beauty. Every challenge that he went through was because of his beauty. So he went through the loss of his betrayal of the brothers because he was the most beautiful. He was sold as a slave because he was, yeah, Bushra. Like, wow, what a beautiful child. He was sent to prison because he was what? Beautiful. Sometimes Allah doesn't give me a certain blessing because the default attached challenge that comes with it will be such that I will lose that fight. Because every blessing comes with a challenge. إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ فِتْنَةً Allah says children are a challenge for us. Sometimes Allah may not give me that job because going there in that specific situation will harm my deen, but Allah gives it to someone else because it won't harm their deen. So if I start looking at Allah's blessings with this vision or rather with this lens, not receiving a blessing is actually a way of Allah saying, I'm protecting you. I'm protecting you. Because every blessing comes with this attached challenge. So his eyesight comes back nonetheless and he says that I told you I knew something. By the way, the brothers then said what? Oh father, astaghfirullakum. 
Rabbi, you know, oh Father, seek, seek forgiveness from, for us from Allah because you were also harmed. And the Father said, What? Sofa, astaghfiru lakum Rabbi. Sofa in Arabic means in due time. And the letter seen means right away. So Allah in Surah Al-Duha tells the Prophet ﷺ, Sofa yu'atik. It's not going to happen right now. But in due time, Allah will give you to the point that you are pleased. But it's not happening now for sure. Here, the father also said what? Sofa. The question becomes, why did he say Sofa for? Why not just seek forgiveness for his children? Two answers. One's the humane, like the human natural reaction answer, and one is the spiritual answer. You want both or one? What do you want? You sure? Okay. Because one of them is a little heavy. The first one is that Yaqub is after all a father. And he's processing what's happening. It takes time. I know you're asking me for forgiveness, but that's a, that, it's too heavy for me right now. I need some time. You told me my son was dead for 60 years. I need time. And that's okay. That's human nature. We don't blame him for that. If it was us, we would probably done more than that. I just need time. Sometimes you go to someone and ask them for forgiveness, and because it took you so much courage, you expect the person to say yes right away. But you don't really know what that harm caused them and how deep those wounds cut. So the person may need some time. And that's perfectly okay. And it also shows the, the level of pain he, what he experienced. Like, I'm, just, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm ready to forgive you. I'm not sure. I need some time. But I'll get there, but I just need some time. The second is, which is the more common opinion, and it's the more accepted opinion as well, by the way, that when he was asked to seek forgiveness, it was a time of zawal. And you're not allowed to pray at the time of zawal. So he said, give me some time, I'll pray for you when I'm allowed to pray for you. Which is, which is all, I mean, they don't, they don't conflict each other. They actually support each other. But one opinion does not deflect the other one. The human nature is, is something which we're allowed to have, like the human response. But we shouldn't feel guilty if we can't say the words right away, but we have to get there. We have to uh, get there. Allah's forgiveness for us is dependent upon us forgiving people. So our biggest motivation, when someone asks, now end with the story. Someone asked Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, rahimahullah, who was in prison for 12 years, and he was flogged, right? Where his back had deep holes inside of them because of a certain difference that he had with the king. And when he was beat so mercilessly, and he was kept in prison for a decade, when he finally was released from prison, and they were doing surgery on his back, the entire time he was whispering something. And the son said, Oh father, I heard you saying something during the surgery. What were you saying? He said, I was saying, Allahu maghfir mu'tasim. Mu'tasim was a king who flogged him. Okay? And he's saying, oh Allah, forgive mu'tasim. Oh Allah, forgive mu'tasim. So father, why would you be saying, oh Allah, forgive mu'tasim for? It doesn't make any sense. He's the one that caused you all this pain. He said, really, it's hard to forgive him. But the only reason I'm asking Allah to forgive and I am forgiving him is because the Prophet says in a hadith that he narrates, Imam Ahmad Muhammad narrates this in his book, that the Prophet of Allah says in a hadith that I will not enter into Jannah until my last ummati enters. And this is so beautiful. He says, I don't want to be the reason of the Prophet's entrance into Jannah, into Jannah being delayed. The depth of love that must that this person must have to, e to, to even be able to think of this is beyond our beyond our imagination. Like I, I just I don't want the prophet to wait longer. He struggled enough. Just because I am being petty, I forgive him. And he had this beautiful poem where he would say, We should forgive not because you love the person alone, but because you love the fact that the Prophet loves him. The Prophet loves every one of us. That's enough motivation. So of course, Yaqub forgave his sons, and then, but it's, 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 it's important to be mentioned because everyone has different ways of responding to trauma and to harm and pain, and we should feel comfortable with it. 
The story continues now finally the, the fifth high. The fourth high was the brothers being exposed to who they were. And the fifth high was the father coming to Misr. And this is like, if, if meaning Bin Yamin was the climax, this is like part two of it, right? The son goes ahead. Now, Ibn Kathir Rahimullah mentions, the son gathers 70,000 people from the army and he travels to the outskirts of the city and he just camps there. You know when you go back home to our countries, Syria, you know, Jordan, Pakistan, any country that we're from, and you get to the airport, like half the country is there to pick you up. Everyone's hugging you, meeting you, expecting a gift. <laughs> That's a good sign. That means we're what? We're loved. Imagine reaching the airport in Lahore or Karachi and no one's there. Brother, that means take a quick return flight. <laughs> Because we, as humans, we reciprocate love or show love by the welcoming that we have. Like how was the, the Prophet welcomed to Medina? Everyone there. That's how you show love. This is why the Sunnah is that when your parents walk into the house, you get up to greet them. This is to show, not respect, but love. So you can do it for your children too, by the way. And for your spouse. It's not about authority here, it's about love. The Prophet of Allah will stand for Fatima. Like, in the culture where people used to bury daughters, when Fatima would enter into the room, he would stand up and bring her through the door. Like that's, imagine like a CEO standing up for the desk employee. I'm not saying that's the example. Like that, that's authority. The Prophet is the Prophet of Allah. And when Fatima would enter, he would stand up, hug her, qabbala bayna aynayhi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Kiss her between the eyes. And then he would, ajlasaha fi majlisihi. He would make her sit on the spot that he was sitting at. Like give her the head of the table. That's how much you would honor his daughter. Right? When Ali Ali got into argument with Fatima, he said, Hey, don't harm her, it harms me. That would be a tough task to be married to. Like it's tough to be married to a Sheikh's daughter, right? But to marry to the Prophet's daughter, shh, man. Ali Adlana was extremely just for that to work, as of course he was. So he takes seventy thousand people out and he waits for the father to come. And when the father and the and the and the caravan comes close. He leaves the people there and he rushes forward to greet his father. Ibn Kathir Rahimullah mentions that Abdullah ibn Abbas says that when the father, when Yusuf Salam came close, he took his arm down and he used it as the, um, as the peg. What would they call the thing on the, on the horse that, that to step on to come off? The syrup, not the saddle, the syrup. He used that and his father stepped on it out of honor and respect and he came down and he removed his helmet, placing on his father, and they were able to, and again, they mentioned something very similar, that when they met, the army said, takbir, and it was as if the entire city shook. Like, imagine the father being like, welcome like a king, right? Welcome, oh father, welcome home. And, the, and, and I'm going to fast forward just to one point that I feel like is, I mean, everything's worthy of being mentioned, but with the time that we have, the Yusuf Yus Yus started to flex a little bit. He said, Oh, Father, you love me that much that you cried, that you lost your eyesight? Like that much? Hey, that's a lot of love. The Father said, Oh, Son, مَا بَكَيْتُ مِنْ أَجَلِ فِرَاقِكْ وَلَكِنْ بَكَيْتُ لِأَنِّي أَظُنُّ أَنَّكَ تَمُوتَ عَلَى غِيرَ مِنَّةِ الْإِسْلَامِ He says, Oh, Son, Allahumma sallam Muhammad, what a powerful statement. He says, Oh, Son, I didn't cry because, like, I thought I lost you. I thought I lost you in the Akhirah. Meaning I thought, I, I, I thought you died without being Muslim. Because he's, oh son, he's like, what is this? This is, هَذِهِ الْإِجْتِمَاعَ بِأَذَانِ الْفِرَاقِ He says, this is being reunited, but the adhan of being separated is already being made. Meaning I'm so old now. I'm so old. And they say less than, less than a year later, Yaqub passed away. And this is when Yusuf made the dua, O oh Allah, tawaffani muslima wa alhiqni bisaliheen. They say, Abdullah ibn Abbas says, the only prophet that was allowed to make the dua of, of oh Allah, take my life was Yusuf. Where he said, O oh Allah, la tabtilni fihi maratain. Don't test me and my father twice. You took, me, you took him from me once. I managed. Now you brought him back to me and took him from me again. Oh Allah, I'm ready to go. 
Tawaffani Muslim. Some say it wasn't one year, some say it was five years, some say it was seven. But again, if Allah didn't mention it, that means it wasn't important. But the idea remains the same, that there was no way that the time that they had in dunya was equal to the time that they were away from each other. And that's how he welcomed his father back home. And that's how he honored his father, which was the fifth high. What we take from the entire story is not necessarily just the, the emotions of it. I do believe that the emotions of it play a huge role in our love for this story. Because we find a story in which that each and every one of us can find ourselves in. This is why Allah used the word naqussu. That I'm taking you on someone else's journey with you standing in their shoes. Because there's not a single one of us that hasn't experienced betrayal at some point of our life. Or some level of mistrust, loss of loved ones, or basic disrespect. And all of that is to say that whatever we went through wasn't nearly close to any degree of what Yaqub went through and Yusuf went through, I said. And at the end of this, we see that Allah's qadr will always honor the one that was oppressed. إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ الْمَظْلُومِ اِتَّقِي دَعْوَةَ الْمَظْلُومِ The Prophet told the Sahabas, be wary and watchful of the dua of the oppressed. فَإِنَّ لَيْسَ بَيْنَهُ Because there is nothing between the dua and Allah as a barrier. It goes directly to Allah, like the dua of a parent and a dua of a madloom. It goes direct. So, in all the stories of the Qur'an, the, the victory crown has always been placed on the head of the oppressed. Never the oppressor. The oppressed, the oppressor may be forgiven, but they never become the victorious ones. Victory was always given to the oppressed. And lastly, we don't let our situations be a cause of rotting our character. Then every moment you found consistency in Yusuf salam. He did not let the situation that he was in to dictate the responses that he gave. We allow our situations to dictate our responses. Whereas people like him السلام, allowed his ethics to dictate his response. Which was a, a response of a dignified, honorable, forgiving, loving person. Like we can't really enjoy the story of Yusuf if we only experience the pain without forgiveness. If we were wronged, we are like Yusuf, but not really. Because he was wronged and he what? He forgave. He was broken, but yet he helped people. He did not make it a condition to help that he had to be helped. He didn't have an inferior mentality or a mindset that he needed a handout. He was always there to support people. All of this is simply remind us, at the end of this, Yaqub is taken away, Yusuf passes away, Allah is reminding us that everything that is of goodness in this world will come to an end. The fragility of this world is the highlight of the story. That nothing lasts except for that which we did for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ So our life isn't there to simply make sure that every moment lasts in dunya. If that was the case, the Prophet knew that he had limited time with his children. He would have enjoyed it. Our life is such that we want to make sure that every moment of Akhirah truly means something to us. So may Allah make us amongst those people that can truly fall in love with the Book of Allah, fall in love with these Prophets, fall in love with their stories, fall in love with the lessons that we take from those stories so we can embody it into our children and our community members so that inshallah, just like how the Prophet was always able to forgive, empower, enable, strengthen, be a source of comfort regardless of what state he was physically, emotionally in. That we can also be a community of that nature like how Yusuf salam was for his brothers. May Allah bless you all, reward you all for being such attentive listeners and respectful listeners that I know I went like 20 minutes past time. I mean, 26 minutes past time. Um, it's late, my eyesight, you know. Um, I need a shirt. <laughs> um, but forgive me for that. May Allah bless you all. Forgive you all. I know we're supposed to have a Q&A. If you have any questions about this, I'll answer them on my own without holding everyone back. I'm still here, but I don't want to hold everyone for the questions. It is pretty late, so I'll be here inshallah ta'ala. If anyone has questions, I'm, 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 I'll be more than happy to answer your questions inshallah ta'ala. Zakallah khair. It's always beautiful being in the Bay Area. We welcome you to visit us in Michigan as well. Whenever you get the chance, inshallah ta'ala, we'll be more than happy to host you in Michigan as well, inshallah. When you're by MCC, may Allah reward you all. Zakallah khair. We'll be back on February 2nd. February 2nd, inshallah. 
I'll be back for the same conference that we did this year, inshallah, with about seven, eight speakers. You, know, you guys remember like in February? Who was here in February? A few of us. So the conference that we had, we'll have one again in February, inshallah. February 2nd, it'll be a Ramadan conference, inshallah ta'ala. Allah bless you. Allah bless you.